All right, ladies and gents, boys and girls, and everything in between. That's right. This is time for another interview with Peretti is here. Peretti One, however you want to call it. If you want to see more of what I do, you know what to do. Go to Peretti1.com and also check out my live shows Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, 6 p.m. Eastern time on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash Peretti One. And if you just want to see where you're seeing this interview right now on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Peretti Music. Today we got the mighty... The notorious Jamie King in the his house. Boom! Boom. How's it going, Jamie? <laughs> How's it going, man? Doing good, doing good. Dude, the, y'all, this guy is the brother from another mother, my hero in music and all the shit that I do. If you know anything or heard anything that I've done in the last, what, 15 years, um, it has passed through this guy's ears and his equipment at some point mm-hmm. for some reason. And uh, what, we have been in the studio with past bands that record a couple albums. Mostly he's been mastering this stuff that I've been doing. So I know that we have we did like a little interview once before and we've talked. Um, but for the people that haven't seen that stuff, because all those old interviews, for, uh, unfortunately, were on a hard drive that's no longer there. Um, so they didn't get to see the first one. A lot of people that, that are coming in now. Um, tell us about I know that you start off with a basement. What what? got that transition was it married life to get to you a whole new studio uh are you talking about like when i moved from my parents place to this house <laughs> well or, or just changing yeah studio locations <laughs> exactly yeah so from one basement to another yeah i mean i just worked out of my parents basement you just out of uh, necessity honestly like i said i didn't have a, enough money to have a facility or anything and uh you know, I was, uh, my parents were always super cool and supportive of my music. And, you know, my band, you know, had started having practice there since I was like 13. And uh, so I just kind of silently transitioned that into a recording business without my parents' uh, permission, really. <laughs> uh, I don't know if they just re- re- thought that I was just, you know, still having band practice or something. In the <laughs> recording. I just, but I was living in apartments and stuff with girlfriends at the time. And, uh, um, you know, so I, I just continued to work out of the, my parents' basement because, you know, as you know, you know, Swift was uh, talking to labels and stuff like that up until uh, about, about 2001. Uh, so basically, like, you know, the whole recording thing was like, hey, I'll just do this until the band signs the record deal. And, uh, you know, and we'll, we'll figure, you know, I'll figure out the uh, studio stuff later. Well, of course, right. like, you know, 9-11 happened and kind of pulled the rug out from under the uh, the Swift uh, MCA record label mm. deal. And uh, that's when I decided, hey, I'm just going to start focusing on recording. And then I made it a plan to uh, you know, just work it on my parents' basement until I get things figured out and get some money uh, situated enough to, to the point where I could buy my own house and, uh, you know, basically start my own basement studio. So here I am at uh, 10 minutes down the road from my parents' house and another <laughs> basement. <laughs> Yeah, you only got 10 has, minutes away. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this but this one has walls and things. Yeah, as you remember, All right, the other right, basement, yeah. The other basement was like, was like, you know, concrete blocks and there's tools <laughs> hanging in the background and all that stuff's still there. It's great. Yeah, but dude, I mean, that was that's what gave it its charm, though. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, I'm sure, I mean, I remember back in that day, you know, everybody had these big thoughts of, you know, ooh, I want to go to the big Hollywood studio, see all that stuff. But looking back on it, I've been in those big studios. I'm like, yeah, it just doesn't beat the basement, you know? It had that <laughs> thing, you know, that certain well, thing. At the time, you know, you know, this is the height of, uh, you know, rap rock, new metal and stuff like that. And it was kind of a, you know, kind of a trend. It, there was a trend, you know, for bands to sound a little bit on the raw side, more natural, organic. You know, it was kind of the all, back end of the alternative movement. So uh, I think that environment actually played to that. Um, to that aesthetic or whatever it wasn't super clean yeah. and polished you know i didn't you know the bands were setting up live and just playing their set and then we'd open yeah. up vocals and leads as you remember and uh there's yeah there's i mean there's some integrity in that the back back in the day the bands had to play they had to know the material they had to be yeah. well rehearsed they had to be able to play you know consistently dynamically uh you know uh, precisely what they were pl- trying to play and uh you know, honestly, there's, you know, back then there was a lot of bands who could do that. I don't feel like there's a lot of bands who could do that these days. You know, everybody kind of relies on the studio trickery and, you know, tracking individually and things like that to uh, to have a listenable product. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, the, the old school basement, I mean, you know, actually the room, you know, had exposed insulation and, 
you know, rafters and things like that. And uh, I remember that cage on the side. That yeah, that was weird. Yeah. My mom's <laughs> exercise uh, partition. <laughs> that was, yeah, that was. Uh, I don't. I'm not sure the, the thinking of that was, but uh, but yeah, the, because it was an old house, the, the the you know it had like odd angle walls in the basement, which is strange. It didn't have just square walls, and the exposed insulation rafters with a concrete floor. I mean, it was like like strangely the the environment was a good sound for like drums and a loud rock band oh, it was uh, great it was great yeah it was bright it was bright and it had uh you know it wasn't completely dead but it wasn't so live that it was problematic and uh you know i had the drum riser thing for band practice and uh, yep. uh it kind of you know the drums were kind of isolated on a, on a wooden surface and things like that there were a lot of things that uh actually worked to our sonic advantage that i didn't even you know plan um, oh, yeah. I remember we just recently had gone back and you know, I've been doing a lot of remixes for bands who had recorded, uh, you know, my parents old basement and, uh, and I was surprised at how good the tones actually were when we were like, you know, going back to remix and just with some basic EQ and proper dynamics treatments, you know, stuff that I didn't know how to do properly or didn't have the gear to do properly back in the day. You know, I was like, man, these rival the sounds that I'm getting now with, you know, I got $50,000 of gear to right. get these sounds <laughs> right. and, you know, I had probably five thousand dollars a gear a gear back then. It was like how are these sounds almost as good as what I, it was just blowing my mind. I had to honestly, pay money I to have. I, I, I think just, it's you, honestly, man. Well, I mean, I, well, one thing I realized is that the environment doesn't play as as important as of a role as uh, a lot of, of course, studio owners would like you to believe. Uh, right. Just just as long as there's not any super negative things, you know, like you know, if you don't have a a, a, a space that's just too reverberous for certain elements like vocals or whatever, or, you know, like I said, I mean, anybody can track, you know, top, top level pro vocals, you know, just get in your closet with some clothes, you know, or yep. like, you know, yep. hang up a couple quilts just to get the reflections out of the mic. And it's going to be essentially the, a similar environment to an isolation booth that I have here in the studio purpose built for the, for, for doing that. And, uh, you know, and same thing, it's like, you know, with the convolution reverbs today, you know, uh, you don't have to have a like a huge um, drum room to track drums and still get a huge drum room sound. You know, you can you can emulate that, you know, uh, uh, you know, very realistically, you know, the convolution reverbs are just digital recreations of real spaces. So you can actually yeah. uh, put your drums in a better space than what you would ever be able to afford, even on with regular major label budgets. You know, there's the studios are just off, off, you know, or like, you know, uh, concert venues and things like that or yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> that's what i'm saying yeah it's, it's, it's gonna sound great in there yeah i mean like i said i mean just as long as you don't have any negative you know any like standing waves any like reflections getting to the mic that sound bad or causing phase issues and things of that nature um and all that stuff's easily controllable in almost any environment with some sort of gobo or makeshift gobo type thing and you, you just use moving blankets or quilts from goodwill or something like that to put around your equipment uh, to isolate so uh yeah I believe, so there's, there's some great tips right there a lot of people have asked me what i've done to uh you know because they they've seen the live shows that i came out at some point i was always in that back bedroom and they're like well I, you know you're not in a in a booth how, how are you keeping that reverberation i was like honestly this room is so small it's got my bed my yep. green screen everything else there's nowhere for the sound to bounce from it's all exactly. sucked into everything you know there's yeah. no nothing metal or hard or reflective even in that room so yeah yeah in my room if you notice i might be able to uh, move my camera around so you can see oh, i just have you know it's my studio room i you know i have all my junk in here uh <laughs> you know the amps the drums are sitting there you know everything's at easy access um you know but uh, you know a lot of that's kind of by design you know obviously it's it's nice to be able to just grab things when you need it yeah uh, but it's also you know it's like i said it breaks up all the uh uh, the reverberations to have some things in the room, you know, a lot of times just a bookshelf will act as you, know, you could spend thousands of dollars on real, you know, purpose built diffusers or have a bookshelf yeah. with some books on it. You know, it's just like, right. right. It's, you know, obviously, you know, if you're wanting, you know, if you have a client who's looking for that, you know, big money experience and it, you know, the studios are nice and they can be, you know, they can certainly be a, a lot of fun to get a really nice natural sounding reverb, but it's just like, you know, honestly, with most, especially rock and metal, the reverb is kind of, you know, it's not the main thing in the mix. You know, it's like it's it's in the background of the mix. So an emulation versus the real thing is not going to be noticeable by even 
even most professionals ear, you know, wouldn't be able to tell with the convolution reverbs today, like wouldn't be able to say, Oh, that's definitely recorded in a small room or, right. or a big, you know, you know, with well, a, there's like thousands and thousands of reverbs, reverb settings and plugs, plugins yeah. and stuff like that. I mean, Oh yeah. You can emulate anything. And that's the thing I work out in my parents' basement. You know, I was able to uh, just pull up some of these settings that I've, uh, that I use even since I've been in this room and it almost sounds identical. It's just, uh, it's just unbelievable, really. You know, I, I there were so many times where I'd go back to uh, that old Stiff album, and I would try like hell to replicate that sound from when we were in your studio, and it just wasn't happening. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, artificially, it's not going to happen. I just, I'm set on that. It's just not. And that's it's, the only option I got right now is artificial like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're getting closer and closer, you know. I mean, that's the thing with the program stuff is like, obviously, there's a, you know, there's an element with natural performance that, uh, you know, it's, 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 you know, there's, a, I guess, a fluidity to the dynamics and all that stuff. It's just hard to, uh, it, time consuming to emulate in the, in the program realm. I think it's doable. It's totally doable, but you could, you know, for one song, you'd spend weeks on the drums trying to like, you know, right. emulate all the nuances of a, of a drummer. Then you get blind ear, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just hard. You know, to me, it's just like, it's just quicker just to have a drummer quicker and honestly cheaper when you look at the time that you had to spend to just get a session drummer and track some drums and, and do the production on them as opposed, you know, and you're going to have more of a, a vibe and energy. But like I said, there's certain styles of music that the program stuff really lends itself to, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, you know, white zombie back in the day, there's lots of huge artists that had uh -huh. program elements and, you know, it really contributed to, you know, uh, to the, to the vibe, you know, the fear factory stuff was really uh, produced and, quantized and all that stuff so i mean it just depends on uh what aesthetic you're looking for you know saying and uh, there's no right or wrong way but uh but yeah if you're going for real then obviously you know the best thing to do is just set up some drums and uh, have some guitar it. amps and right. yeah and just and just jam you know that's god be man i just that's that's something i just miss the most man out of any studio thing is just rocking out with some guys man you know yeah throw down some tracks um, speaking of session drummers, I, I, I'm going to, um, I'm going to figure out a way to bribe you into finishing my album, doing the drums for me. Um, I should be able to play soon. But I mean, you know, as I, I may have told you, I may or may have not, but I broke my arm like last summer on a hike. Or no whatever. shit. Yeah. I broke my wrist. It was the first thing I'd ever broken or whatever, but I slipped in a Creek and broke my wrist and, uh, uh, but yeah, I should be able to play now. I was feeling, feeling pretty much okay. You know, I haven't played drums much since just cause. I've been busy. Well, that's a bitch to heal up, man. I mean, I've I've sprained my wrist. I've broken lots of bones, but I've never broken my wrist. But I even from a, a wrist, man, it yeah, gets. Uh, luckily, it's hard it to a, heal up. Luckily, it was like a, you know, like a clean fracture or whatever. Um, right. According wow. to the, uh, according to the uh, X-ray and the professionals or whatever, and right. yeah, so it cost <laughs> me a thousand, tossed me a thousand dollars for them to like look at X-ray and like, yeah, it's broken, but it should heal by itself. Give me a thousand bucks. I'm just like, I actually, you know, uh, I'll tell you, story, what, but, be like, all right, well, since it's going to heal by itself, it should be fine. Like, a thousand bucks should just walk in by itself, too. How's oh, there's that? a long, there's a long, deep story. This is a whole nother podcast about the uh, medical system. But, uh, yeah, I, I was <laughs> going to sue because they, like, there was some weird code and it was like 800 bucks. I'm like, what is this for? And nobody could tell me after like five people i talked to and you know upper you know the billing department upper management and all this stuff they're finally like oh yeah it means it stand the code stood for future potential treatments i'm like <laughs> you're charging oh, me eight hundred dollars for potential future treatments it's like going into a restaurant and be like hey we're gonna go ahead and charge you for dessert uh yeah, for everybody at the table that. because they might want it it's like this just should be that's some harsh shit man you're damn right that's that's that dude i mean it is what, what? yeah it's, what, it, what if you I, walked in there and gave that doctor and bill and said you might want to buy the next swift album so here's a bill for it exactly you know? yeah it's ridiculous but i talked to a lawyer and they thought i might have a case at first but then they researched the laws and they were like the problem is the uh the definition of treatment is so broad it's like just the doctor like looking at that uh x-ray is considered treatment in the eyes of the law they didn't even touch my arm they put, they gave me a splint. So the nurse put a splint on my arm or whatever, which was a hundred bucks, uh, which I could have bought at Walmart for 25, but yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, you know, so I, I pay, I was willing to, I was down to pay for that and the office meet, you know, appointment and all this stuff, but this $800 future potential treatment thing just blew my mind. Like so you got stuck with that anyways, there was nothing you could do about it. Yeah. Cause they said, yeah, I talked to a lawyer and they were like, you know, and the, 
you know, the whole Man. notion that, oh, you don't have to pay. You can just pay a minimum and they can never hold it against your credit. That's, that's a lie. Somebody just made that. Oh, up. No, no, yeah, that's bullshit, dude. My yeah, you is- have to pay or you're, you're yeah, they'll they'll destroy you. Your credit's done if you don't pay the bills. I mean, I as pay. you know, I've been to the hospital and doctors more times than you know. I mean, I'm like fragile or something. But <laughs> yeah, my my credit is forever. To, well, that and my ex wife, but still, <laughs> I mean, it's it's like gone. There's no hope of it. I mean, you know, the hospitals they will be, and I've heard that same crap. You could pay one dollar a month. They want bullshit. No bullshit. It's, it's a lot. Yeah, I don't know who came up with that, but I talked to the lawyers and. Uh, you know, I've actually talked to people in the billing departments and things, and they, they're just like, no, that's uh well, like I said, that's a whole nother special here. Right, you know? right. We're not even <laughs> doing that area, right? <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you who created that 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 notion that you could pay one dollar is the same jackass that created the slogan your way right away. I like yeah. to choke both of them. You yeah. know, yeah, like, it's I mean, not true. And speaking of Burger King and reverb, natural reverb, I still have to argue that the Burger King bathroom is the best natural reverb you can get. <laughs> Me oh, and yeah. my boys, when I was a manager of Burger King, after we closed down, we practiced. We had a little acoustic trio, like when I was oh, yeah. 18 or 19. We practiced in the bathroom because we sounded beautiful in there. You know, Dude, that. <laughs> I've been for the past year or more, I've been miking. You know, I have the bathroom strangely located right next to my live room. So when I'm tracking drums, I actually mic the bathroom because it has you know that reverberation on the shower stall, and like and shit. Yeah. in the yeah and the the concrete or whatever. And I add it in my mix, and it makes it's like a psychoacoustic trick, especially when you add it to the convolution reverb. It sounds like you know you're tracking the drums in a huge, large, or a pretty you know pretty decent size you know drum tracking room. So it's, see, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is what I talk about when I say the man is a genius. I'm you know. <laughs> I think people right now are thinking that I've got some kind of crush on you the way I talk about you. <laughs> but I mean, I, it's like, I, there, there's not enough good thing. The man is just brilliant with this shit. It's just brilliant. You know, well, I, I um, steal other brilliant people's ideas is basically what's going on. I'm you know, smart I enough, I'm smart enough thing, to recognize know. other people who know what they're doing. But I yeah, remember, I remember your dad one time I met him one time and uh, we're, we're tracking some vocals with that band stiff and the drummer I had had some DWs. And um, the your dad came downstairs and you said, Dad, look, DWs. And I, I thought, what? You know, I didn't think much of it. But Pearl has always been my thing. You know, honestly, I thought they sounded OK. I wasn't too impressed because just like you said with them, the, 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 the uh, residence is a little bit thick, you know. Yeah. And that's the problem I'm having with these, honestly. Oh, really? I, I just, I'm just waiting for that day I can get you here and make it. Yeah, I still, I'm still planning to come. It's just like, I said, uh, just well, we, we both, we both have had crazy ass schedules, but I mean, it's like no matter what I do, I cannot. And I think that I'm trying too hard to make them sound like the pearls that I've played. Cause as you know, I, I use both synthetic and real drums in my recordings. Mm-hmm. Most, you know, I don't get to do a whole lot of real stuff because I got too many cramps and aches and shit like that, but I do it as much as I can. But at the same time, I'm spoiled on those, on those pearls. So yeah. I sit down behind these and every time I, I jam, I'm like, Oh, it's just <laughs> not the same, you know, <laughs> we, we can get it. Happen. They, they, those can sound great, but yeah, the pearls generally have thicker shells, which is a, uh, you know, they're more of a, you know, particularly the, the lower level Pearl stuff. They're really nice for metal and rock. They just, they have a nice solid punch and you right. know, they're not, they're not, uh, you know, I think DW's, you know, they, uh, DW is a company and their design or whatever, primarily they, they tend to go with really thin shells and obviously the PDP are a little thicker. And so they're a little more punchy than the DW's, but, uh, you know, their, their main focus is a big open resonant sound. Yeah, which is which great, great for certain jazz, styles. It, you know? Yeah, R and B, you know, yeah. hip hop stuff like that. Right. But yeah, metal. Like I said, I mean, I've had tons of DWs, and uh, you know, they they do make incredible stuff. You know, great quality hardware, yeah. everything. He's like, but the tones really usually don't naturally suit uh, punchy metal and rock to me. You know, it's like I want I a little bit either. more a weight and stab to the tone as opposed right. to a big boomy. You know, uh, you know, a tom exactly. that resonates for four, five seconds. You know, that's exactly, exactly. So, uh, that's that's why I think that they they'd be great for like jazz drumming. And, and I don't, when they when I got written to about this about doing the review and everything, I said, I said, I, yeah, I can. I said, listen, I don't, I don't want to turn down free drums, but just to let you know, I'm partial to Pearl. You know, yeah. Whatever the, you know, whatever that. And the guy that wrote, he said, he, he even put ha ha in a smiley face. He said, I don't really care. You know, I just want the review. I said, send them to me. Shit, you know, yeah. but. 
I was hoping to nail a Pearl sponsor. I really was. <laughs> I, I guess you got to be a superstar for that. I don't know. Um, well, I don't know. The PDP are just as big these days. I mean, it's a huge company. You know, the whole GW thing is massive for drums. So, and those drums, yeah. trust me, we'll get those drums happening. And they, they can sound great. And uh, they just, uh, you know, they require maybe a little bit more muffling for the tones that you're going to want, you know. Right. Uh, you know, we'll throw, you know, a pillow. There's a PDP actually makes a pillow that I, I'm really partial to. It's a. Uh, I've got one in my bass drum. They sent one with a kick. It's yeah, like this, a weird bowed thing, and I, it's in there. Yeah, yeah. The kick is the kick is doing you know better than the rest of it. Those damn toms, it just bong bong bong. You know, I've got insulation. I got shit in there. I mean, it, <laughs> right now, if you saw the inside of it, it looks like you know somebody bought their first drum set and they're shoving shirts and crap in there. You know? I mean, I I just well, can't, that's the know. sound. You know, some people, yeah, I, you know, there's like. Drums are difficult because there's like, you know, even though there's the, you know, there's the internet, you know, there's more education and stuff out there than ever, but it's still, you know, to hear the drums online, you know, uh, through some sort of microphone, it's just, you can't really, it's hard to learn to tune the different tuning methods and, the, and stuff like that uh, when you're not in person. Like I can go over what I do with you in person. You'd be like, oh, okay. Yeah. That makes complete, that's easy. You'll see how right. easy it is. But then I could go over the same method online and you would just be still not understand it because you're not hearing <laughs> right. the stuff, the stuff the same way you would if you're in the room with it. And it's, I think that's part of the problem. And there's there so many different tunings and so many different muffling approaches and heads configurations for different. It's too tones. much, man. It's too much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just know after, you know, after 500 drum sets or so or whatever, you know, you kind of learn what heads, what tuning methods, what muffling techniques are not yield what different sounds you know out of trial and error yeah. and uh i got like kind of a mental database for it and uh, it would just be and honestly like i said different and, and different drums or different heads specifically uh require different uh tunings different uh, yeah, that techniques. was part of the deal is i can't trade uh, change the heads on them that i have to use the heads that came on because they are the dw p p php pdp whatever they call them those are the heads before they want me to use really those heads. yeah and i'm like Whatever. Uh, no. You know? <laughs> I know. I I'd, I'd imagine. I, I'd imagine they're they made suck, by Remo. Dude, honestly, sure. I think oh, they yeah, sound Remo. good, but they're not I ideal for the sounds. I know the sounds you want are punchy and deep, and yeah, and that yeah. kind of thing. And, and yeah, you want a two ply on the toms. Period. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. At they, least some Remo really Emperors or some pinstripes or maybe some Evans G two or Aquarian dude, performance I, suit. And there's like about some Remos, man, especially the pinstripes too. Yeah, I would just tell him sorry. You know, it's like you know, you could if you want to record jazz or some regular, you know, light rock or something. Those Aquarians, I mean, those uh, single ply, you know, a ambassador type heads would be fine. But I wonder, yeah, I, mean, I uh, wonder if I could get away with none of them seeing this, and then we can just say, hey, you know, we'll <laughs> swap them out and then put them just, back on. <laughs> hey, get a get a stamp, a PDP stamp, made and just. <laughs> We'll make it look just like. <laughs> I'll give my guy to make stickers. We'll just put the yeah. stickers. On. Yeah, exactly. We're gonna probably get them off a little bit anyway. So that was, <laughs> but that way they get their, uh, you know, their advertisement. But I'm, yeah. they may actually have some that you can buy and sell. Uh, Maybe I'm, I'm definitely gonna inquire about it, man. Because these things, I mean, even tuning them up to the best I could. There, there is just something off. I mean, there, no matter what I did, I got some kind of damn wrinkle, you know, in in half. Yeah. Some it's of them would do. And that's why I'm like, these are cheap. I mean, it's like they, they, I wanted to call them Fisher Price, you know. I mean, because <laughs> it was like, you know. Anyways, uh, so let's move on to some of the stuff you guys are already hearing. You know, like I said, the genius in this. But you know, we always start off every single stream with uh, the shows brought to to you by, and it's you know usually people that are contributing and this and that and the other thing. But we always include Jamie King audio in it. And quite honestly, you mastered everything I'm putting out there, so it really is. Um, and if it wasn't for all that music and stuff that launched me into this, none of that would be existing anyways. No, so, I'm, you know, that's a, I'm honored was, to be a part of it. all. Oh yeah. And we get, we get people asking in questions, uh, something funny for you. There was, uh, something else that, that brought your name up and it was with motionless and white. I was, uh, on a video and I was chatting with this young guy and, um, it was, uh, with a stream that he was doing. And uh, he was jamming some motionless and white. And I said, hey, the guy that masters all my stuff put out something. He did a, did some kind of a recording or remix or something like that of that band. He yeah. said he stopped. He was jamming a guitar along with it. I thought he was just a guy just jamming along with other music because he was also doing it with uh, Nine Inch Nails and other bands. Right. And he stopped playing. He said he did music with what band? I said motionless and white. He said, what's his name? This guy that masters your stuff. I said, Jamie King. He said. 
And he did something with Motionless and White. I said, yeah. He said, you know, I'm in that band, right? I said, no, I didn't know that. <laughs> it was Ryan. Ryan, oh, the yeah. guitarist. And gotcha. I had no idea. He didn't look the same to me. And I said, no, I had no idea. Well, after talking, he, he remembered. He said it was some kind of remix from a long time ago. And, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, he remembered it then. It had something to do with uh, Tribunal or something, he said. Um, no, I not Tribunal. Uh, Tragic Hero, I think, maybe. Tragic Hero. Tragic Hero, yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's yeah. what I said. So anyway, I, I was blushing for sure. I was like, oh, shit, I'm sitting here talking to a guy. I didn't even know it was, he was in the fucking band, you know. But anyway. There <laughs> well, they wear that. heavy makeup and stuff on stage. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, here's this dude just wearing a flannel and a beard and a hat on just jamming in his chair, you know. And I'm like, I didn't know. What? <laughs> Why aren't you wearing all white makeup? Shit, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> you know, you know, you always wear that day and night. You never take it. But, uh. <laughs> Anyways, um, so I'm gonna bust some of these questions. Uh, you know, have to forgive me. I, I I tend to lose my voice every other week here lately. It's I I'm like I don't know how I'll ever get my album done. But we're gonna get into these questions now. I pulled six, six. Um, I put out about a half hour to an hour before we did this. Anybody got some questions? They come cram cramming in there. So we're gonna start with Dustin from Geneva, New York. Honestly, I didn't read these for the most part. I just grabbed them, but I did grab J Dustin from Geneva because that's my old stomping ground back in high school. Oh, wow. So, uh, it says, I know a lot of your work. Uh, what can you? Oh, yeah. I forgot. I'm going to have to splice this in at the beginning. By the way, y'all, in case you haven't, I don't know about this guy. He's done lots of artists. Like I, the, the library is enormous. And also uh, bands of the like uh, Grammy nominees between the Buried and Me and many others. And you've definitely got to check out his more uh, more of his work. Okay. All right. So Dustin from Geneva, New York says, I know a lot of your work. What can you tell that is different from being in a band and recording from being on stage and playing? When I go to the studio with my band, I am always insecure how I sound with no effects. I sing for my band. Uh, well, it's, you know, I really, I mean, there shouldn't be a whole lot of difference. I mean, honestly, studio should be way easier because, I mean, you can, if you mess up, just back up and punch in or, you know, uh, do a separate take. And, uh, you know, I mean, I would say as a vocalist, particularly, it, it is a new skill to develop because you're not playing, you're not performing with this loud band behind you. You're not holding the mic and jamming. And, yeah. yeah, there's that element too. you know, obviously, you know, sometimes you can get away with holding the mic to a degree, but you don't want to cup the mic as a lot of people do live, um, you know, you unless you want that frequency cut tone. Um, right. It actually, you, you know, it does change the sound. But yeah, I mean, there's something, I mean, you could, you know, a lot of, you know, I would recommend to people, uh, you know, to, to maybe practice, you know, like everybody almost can afford a hundred dollar interface, you know, to hook to their computers or, you know, smartphones or whatever these days. Right. And, uh, you know, and just grab up, you know, get a mic and just practice recording yourself at home, you know, with a, you know, a rough recording of your band or something like that, you know, to get those chops up, uh, uh to get more comfortable in the studio, uh, you know, like it, there's, you know, there's an, it, there's definitely a, a different vibe. In terms, you know, if you're out on the stage in front of everybody, everything's loud. You know, that's a, you know, a, almost a different vibe than when you're in a studio, an intimate setting. You got, you know, people mm -hmm. staring at you through the, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know through the window or whatever. <laughs> you know, I, a, you know, so a lot of people are freaked out by that. But you know, a lot of times, like I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll make everybody. You know, I've got a hangout chill room here, here in my basement, and. Then, I'll just tell the rest of the guys like, hey, you know, I can, I can usually sense if the uh, the vocalist is kind of nervous acting or kind of, you know, uh, you know, is obviously feeling the pressure or just isn't comfortable yet. And I'll just have everybody else go into the other room until, in, at least until the vocalist is comfortable. Uh, you know, it usually doesn't take too long. You know, for most uh, most bands to come in. Uh, you know, see that's well, different, man. That's that's a different kind of engineer right there. But I can vouch for that because the when I first recorded with Jamie King. Um, I didn't, I, I, I never met the guy. I knew him from the band Swift and Swift was an enormous band around here. I mean, they were just, they dominated the Carolinas, you know? So there was all kinds of intimidation. Now, as far as feeling insecure, the only insecurity I felt was here's a guy that's playing a band that's selling out places <laughs> and I'm playing in, in, in somebody's garage. I don't want to sound like ass, but yeah. But Jamie did. He did exactly like he says he does now. He, you know, he kind of he paced it out, let the time go. He even gave me an orange crush out of his fridge, you know. <laughs> and uh, and then after we stopped for half a dozen times, I walked down the road and got a six pack of beer and 
you know, and then that, that broke me and I was good to go after that. But, yeah. um, but that's, that's the way Jamie is. He, you know, he, he lets you get comfortable and everything first, which is a lot of things engineers don't. So I would like to add to what you said. If, if you're feeling insecure in your studio, do what you can to get comfortable, you know, and if, if that means you've got to kick back with your engineer a little bit, you know, and, and get to know him a little bit, befriend the guy or something, you know, um, yeah, because I, if you're not comfortable, you're, it's not going to work. Yeah, a good engineer, good producer. I guess this is more in the realm of production, but a good producer is going to, you know, he's going to kind of read the room, kind of read the individual and try to, you know, try to get him comfortable and uh, secure feeling. So, you know, it's his idea, you know, what I want to do is try to get the uh, the guy to get the best, give me the best take he, he can or the most or the most proper take for the project, you know. Uh, and if he's nervous and you know sometimes you know that nervous energy some people can harness it and actually u- utilize it but um uh, a lot of times you know if he's nervous to the point where you can hear it in, in the voice or he's like holding back he's not letting go and stuff uh then you know that's that's a negative so you know i, I feel like you know it's part of my job to like just be chill i always try to keep a super chill laid back just hey we're just i mean that's one of the positive things about working out of a basement it's like you don't have that large format studio oh it's 90 dollars an hour we've got to hurry up it's like you don't have that oh there's somebody in the room looking at me through the glass i don't know what they're saying you know everybody's right. in the same room here it's super laid back almost like a band practice type of environment nice um, you know where everybody can communicate clearly the only difference here is obviously you're going to be using headphones and and you're going to be in an isolation booth or whatever to track your vocals and uh you know but usually you know I always like let the vocals uh you know get warmed up. I mean, just I'm like, Hey man, let me, I got to get my levels anyway. So why don't you just kind of jam on this and, you know, let me know if you need anything louder or quieter and then you know, get comfortable with your, your levels and stuff. And, and usually that process, you know, if they run through a song once or twice, most of the time they're like, Oh, I see this is going to be easy. I can hear myself. Well, uh, all broken in. yeah, I can see if, if he's, he's feeling uncomfortable with people in the room, I can send them out of the room, you know, do everything, you know, but I have had instances where there's, uh, people who just aren't comfortable at all ever like they're just super oh, really? timid you know intimidated by uh, you know the recording thing or even live you know some people have stage fright right and I imagine i guess i guess it's, it's a similar type of thing but i guess it's more like studio fright where it's like they know it's being recorded and they can't get it out of their head and you know uh there has been some instances where like you know you just have to get what you can get you know and uh and you know i'll work with it on my end or whatever but uh you know, it's unfortunate, but it, some people have that thing. But in my mind, it's like, if you have that problem, you probably shouldn't be a front man of a band. You know? <laughs> right, right. Seriously. I mean, I hate to say it, <laughs> no, but it's like, facts, you, facts, you need to I get mean, over, you need to get over that. If you're going to be the front man of a band, you need to, you need to be cocky. I mean, most, mm-hmm. most and most of the successful artists and bands and uh, musicians, I mean, they have a, you know, the, the certain level of cockiness, you know, that, uh, so mean, that shouldn't even be know. an issue. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know? yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, you, know? you need to, com- you know, you need to own it and command it, you know, and or at least try to pretend, put yourself in that headspace when you step to the mic, you know. Yeah, uh, and just and be man, confident. If none of that doing. works, then uh, you know, get really drunk. I mean, <laughs> there's always, yeah. I mean, whatever you got to do, you know. But I have I mean, had people like. Hey, let me drink this Jack Daniels. It really helps me. And then they're like, oh, I can't do any more vocals after. Oh, yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, you can't see. Beer is one thing because you kind of have a slow, you yeah. know, a slow buzz that you're getting into. Liquor, forget about it, man. You're gonna, <laughs> not only is that going to fuck up your throat, but throat, you're going yeah, to like, good. you're going to be jacked up like that. And the next thing you know, you're going to, you're going to think you're, you're, you're Fred Astaire or something. And you're just going to be like, I I have seen it work with somebody. (laughs) I have seen liquor work with somebody had a cold before. Like it really did clear them up just enough to get a good, uh, whatever finish up the the takes that we needed to finish up. Well, I think it's it's the medicine of everything. (laughs) Um, Yeah, whatever works. Yeah, right. But you know, going to to extend on that though, um, the one thing that Jamie does is he 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 doesn't you know kind of put put it out there that you should be prepared so you know if insecurity is is something that you're not prepared for i would i would suggest working on that first because i mean i even had one one song uh, i think it was like in the third third time we were in there and the whole band we just didn't have it down and he said you know you guys might want to rehearse on this a little bit but he was saying it he said it really nice you know but i mean it's yeah it's you just don't want to put out 
Yeah, you don't want to put out a shit fucking thing. It looked bad on, on the band, looked bad on the studio, you know? I mean, and, and honestly, looking back, I'm, I'm glad we didn't record it. Yeah. Um, so, this happens. It, it still happens to this day all over and over. People come in and they're stoked on their new song and they don't really quite have it down yet or had quite have it figured out. And they almost always like, you know, I, I've, I've just recently got to the point, okay, I'm not going to allow this anymore, you know, because they're wasting their time and, 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 and money and, and my time as well. Cause nine times out of 10, they come back and they want to retrack it. And it's right. like, it's like, dude, we just wasted like, you know, five total hours in the tracking and then you know you know how the production editing takes forever too it's like we did all this production editing on the drums and now you've changed the song structure so now we had to go retrack reproduce you know i mean it can be up to you know you know, most time you know even for a three or four minute long song you're looking at a full day's worth of work oh yeah you know, at least. production at least. yeah so you're yeah, just throwing away week, you know yeah so that's three hundred dollars gone it's like you know everybody's time you know it's like dude it's like it would be it's almost always especially if the artist is local uh, it's almost always better if they just, uh, hey, let's take it home. Let's let's get it to where we're comfortable with the song, all the aspects, exactly. and then we'll come back and track it next time. And uh, so I'm, I'm, yeah, but that still happens all the time, and and more more than ever, really. But I mean, because so many people are, are writing records on Guitar Pro tablature programs, they're not even ever actually playing anything. Oh. So they'll come in the studio and then they try to play it, and they're like, oh wait a minute, I can't play this or. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, rid it's ridiculous i mean it's just like they're having to learn they're having to learn all these crazy riffs that they had written and uh oh realize it's, it's outside of the realm of possibility for <laughs> even like john petrucci or somebody you know, <laughs> <laughs> well dude it sounded really great in my head and it was awesome on a computer i figured i'd play it Put yeah. it where do i put it's my finger I don't even know. <laughs> oh, I, wow. have to, I have to lecture every, I mean, every band that comes in here, I have to just be like, dude, if you're planning to, to learn something in the studio, then we need to book time for it. Because, you know, if you know the song, you can come in and, and do a song in a day, a three or four minute right. long song, you know. But uh, if you don't know the song, you know, we're, you know, you could take, you could spend a half day all day just tracking rhythm guitars. You know, it's just like, right. you know, that's not, to me, it's like, you know, recording is a recording of a performance. You know, it's not a programming. Like if you you're reading stuff off a computer and you track it three or four notes at a time, it's just like, okay, now this isn't a recording anymore. This is like, you know, this is like right. me like copy and pasting parts. You know, I don't know. It's a bizarre. Right. But yeah, I'm, <laughs> well, I totally feel you. I'm all, and you gotta think your 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 demo, or your album. That's your business card. You don't want to. You don't want to hand somebody a business card. If you're an attorney, you don't want to hand somebody a business card saying, I try to be a lawyer, but nine out of 10 times I go to jail anyway. You want to have <laughs> yeah. something that looks good, right? Sound, yeah, substance, or just yeah. sound good, you know? Um, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I don't do that. Crack me the fuck up, man. <laughs> Come in, well, I don't know how to play this. You know? <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean. You know, it's a lot like web design. That's why I got out of it. People, you know, I, I tell, we'd go through this, we'd spend weeks building their website, and then they'd be like, you know, actually, I want it to look more like Google. It's like, why the fuck didn't you tell me at the beginning? With, you know, why didn't you get that laid out? That's so a I huge issue like, here, too, yeah. Bands are like, hey, we want to sound like this when we start the project, and then a new record comes out that they like. But it's yeah, time we finish the project. Sound like that. Yeah, and it's like, dude, that's that's a complete opposite sound that we went for from the beginning, and that's sometimes not possible or... You know, it's well, you know, take... I, I think you've had to deal with me with that with my Vox. Like, I'll hear one thing and it'll sound a certain way. I don't ever try to sound like somebody else, but there's certain elements that they have, like, you know, the certain smoothness or something like that. And I'm yeah. like, all right, I want to capture that. Then I'll, then I'll hear something different. I'm like, no, wait, this is way better. Oh, I'm yeah. like, all right, wait, can we do this? But you're always really gracious about it. You're like, yeah, yeah, we'll run it through this way and try this. Yeah, there's um, nothing wrong with that if you have time, you know, and money for it. You know, this is, uh, you know, a lot of bands, of course, the bands I record, most of them don't, you know, like, do we have, X amount of money for this much time, and then it's like you know, it's uh. I know, bet it's real nice when you get bands like Between the Barrier to Me that just got their shit and they just. Oh yeah, out. yeah, yeah. That's the thing. I mean, they always write the whole record and record it once before they come in. So it's just like you so know, so they find it. Yeah, there, there are. There's always like some experimentation and some, uh, you know, some tweaking, you know, in the studio, and that's to be expected. But it's none of this like. You know, none of this new trend of like people learning stuff off Guitar Pro and, uh, or, you know, or bands thinking it's supposed to be it's written. Hero. In the <laughs> You're like writing lyrics in the booth. It's like, you know, going back to that, you know, <laughs> you, uh, 
the guy's question, you know, talking about being uh, confident in the studio, that's part of it. Be prepared, you know, like have your stuff down and know that you're going to go in and crush it. And then you'll be confident when you step to the mic. Then it's just a matter of getting comfortable with that particular environment and that particular situation with the mic and headphones. And, the, you know, there's nothing to be concerned about. If you know that you know your parts and you're going to do the, you know, you're going to, you're going to, you know, just all you got to do is go in and capture it on the mic. You know, you know I think that's a, that's a good way to, to, to sum that up. You know, if you're, if you're prepared for it, then you're going to be confident in what you do. And then you're exactly. going to go in there and knock it out, you know? Yep. Uh, so Bernie from Houston, Texas says, I have decided I no longer want to be in a band anymore and I want to start learning studio work. I love Between the Barry to Me, by the way, and also Swift since, here we go, he says my name, since Peretti played it on the stream. It is obvious you know your gear, so what is the best DAW, D-A-W, however anybody wants to say it, and rig I should get to learn and begin a to learn and begin being a studio engineer? Uh, well, of course, you know what I'm going to say about this. Uh, I'm still a big proponent of Pro Tools. You know, it's the industry standard, always has been, I think always will be. You know, obviously, it's probably the most expensive route at this point. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's not you know, cheap. <laughs> I mean, they have, you know, I think, what is it, like $20 for per month if you want to do that thing? You know, it's like, it's, so it's not Screw like. A, that. Man, that's yeah, like what Adobe tries that shit. I'm like, no, I'd just rather have the whole, you know, just. I'm yeah, not, I, I personally prefer, but you know, as a beginner, like, hey, I don't know if I'm going to do this or you know, whatever. You know, I, you know, I don't, you know, I don't recommend, uh, you know, people just going out and buying. Hey, I'm going to buy a whole studio and spend you know ten, twenty thousand dollars buying all the gear I need, and then realize, oh, I don't enjoy this, or right, I'm just not, right. I'm not good at this because I mean, there is an art it, about this stuff, and it's you know, you you do. There's a lot of technical uh, stuff, so you have to have you know, kind of a proclivity for you know electronics and, and computers and uh you know obviously you have to be musical you have to you know, have a good sense of pitch and uh rhythm and understand rhythm theory and melodic theory and things like that to really be a good uh, you know producer or engineer and stuff like that so uh, i've seen a lot of people just jump into it and just uh go head first and buy all this gear and all this stuff and not really or just and end up realizing that hey this is not really something i'm good at or something i really want enjoy um, cause it's a bunch of work. I mean, it's a bunch of clickety clack on your Mac, <laughs> as they say, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, it's Dude, just, I mean, yeah. over half the time is just editing and, you know, cleaning up audio and things like that. And people don't realize that they're like, they think it's all fun and games and like, Dude, they think it's, it's all jamming. Yeah. No, you yeah, just spend grueling just like, hours. Yeah. Doing it's just like your, shit. your, your stuff. They see all oh, that look, art looks awesome. I'm like, it's not just fun art. It's a bunch of coding and stuff. You have to learn yeah. the technica. And it takes years. I mean, years yeah. upon years for most people. Uh, but you know, so what I recommend, you know, like I said, I, I do recommend pro tools just because it's the standard and it's like, you know, basically there, there are other inexpensive options, but like, you know, say if you start, uh, you know, the, I guess one of the most inexpensive, uh, and, uh, memed, uh, dolls out there is called Reaper or whatever. A lot of, a lot of oh. people love, <laughs> love that program because it's inexpensive, yeah. but it has limitations. There's going to, you're going to get to a point, especially particularly if you want to do, uh, music with analog components like if you want to record uh analog real drums or real guitars things like that or whatever and you know eventually you're going to want to uh, do things like you know drum quantizing or pocket the temp you know like perfecting the timing on the drums there's no really good tools in reaper you just can't do it in reaper and have right. it sound 100 percent. they don't have pro tools has either they have a patent or nobody's figured it out but they have uh, a thing called Beat Detect, a feature called Beat Detective, which uses a copy and paste algorithm, so it keeps the the uh, you can edit the drums and keep the the uh, the quality a hundred percent. It doesn't do a you know this, this algorithm doesn't use uh, stretch and, and compress like all the other dolls right. do. Yeah, so every, all the other about. dolls they degrade the audio quality unless the drummer's really super close. Uh, it's a noticeable degradation to me. Um, if you want to use real drums, so that's why Pro Tools is the standard. And there's, I mean, maybe some of the other dolls have something I don't know about yet uh, that they've done you know, in recent years. But uh, to my knowledge, there's no other doll that has these things. So basically, I mean, there's a few limitations like that with the other dolls. And, you know, it's particularly if you want to get into, uh, I guess, uh, metal and rock, you know, with organic drums, uh, guitars, things like that. Now, if you're going into hip hop or if you're going into, uh, you know, electronica or something like that. And you're only programming now. Almost all the dolls should be fine for that stuff. And actually, 
you know, like Ableton or, uh, you know, Cubase uh, type stuff or even Reaper. And, uh, yeah. Or yeah, FL Studio or your, uh, what's the Apple one? Uh, I've got it on my Garage computer. Band or something like that. Well, GarageBand's fine, and uh, but it's, what's the other big one? Uh, anyway, like I said, I mean, the uh, uh, Logic, Logic is what I'm thinking of. Uh, Logic. Those, they're actually kind of better for the MIDI stuff because it's more user friendly. It's more streamlined. The Pro Tools, you can do everything. And it's like, for a lot of people, when they get into the MIDI component of Pro Tools, it's like, it's just really, uh, I guess, uh, confusing and laborious to them because there's too many options. And these other platforms, they're more simple and they're, they have less free, less uh, features. So you can actually learn quicker and easier. So I think if you're going into the electronica stuff, so maybe not do Pro Tools, maybe do, uh, uh, you know, maybe do like a Logic or something like that, you know, or, uh, you know, uh, whatever's cheap, whatever's easy for you to do. Because my thing is like, once you start in a doll, you're not going to ever want to leave it because once you, it takes years to learn lying. it. You're not lying. It's you, a learning it curve. Once you, yeah. yeah. And if you, if you're like, Hey, okay. You know, if you start in Reaper, like, okay, now I need to learn how to do drums. Like, Oh, well now I got to switch to pro tools. Well, guess what? You're not starting from scratch, but you're starting, it's going to kick you back maybe a year in, in, yeah. in habits in terms of key, you know, key code, uh, you know, combinations and, uh, you know, just processes and things like that. So, I mean, my thing is, uh, it, you know, like I said, there again, like if you want to do this as a career, you know, you, almost every major studio has Pro Tools. Like if you're going to go go into another studio to track a project, and they're going to have Pro Tools, you got to know it. You know right. what I'm saying? It's like you know, there's certain production stuff that only can be done 100% on Pro Tools. You got to know it. You know, it's like the uh, and it's like some some of the big major labels they require the files to be sub provided in Pro Tools format at the end of the thing. So even if you track it in something else, you have to import it all into a Pro Tools session. Right. I've said, there's a lot of engineer guys I know who do, they will mix and like uh, in Sonar or something like that. And then, but they're actually tracking and editing in Pro Tools. I'm like, why don't you just do everything in Pro Tools? I don't like, I mean, what, <laughs> there's no rules. So whatever works for you, but um, that's my advice as far as a doll. And uh, Well, that's good advice. Cause you got a point. I mean, you know, I look, I, <laughs> I tried to get into Pro Tools a couple times, and I, I chalked it up as like old dog new tricks at this point. I just it gave me such a splitting headache to try to learn it. That I was like, I, I can't do it. I got to go back to where it was, you know. Which yeah. I know that there's a bad curve to that because, you know, I'm limited. You know, obviously. And you've well, been you're doing like I said, you that, you do mainly program based stuff, so I think that's uh, it works great for that. You know, and and all these things you can do all the vocal stuff. I think you know. Yeah, well, some, yeah, like, uh, like, uh, okay, so, um, honestly, I'll put a lot of my vocals on, on FL just to get that, um, in FL Studio, just to get that, that, um, uh, you know, those, those, I can't think of it right now, those extra plugins to make it, you know, compressed and then maximize yeah, and all yeah. that stuff, you know, because like some other DAWs I've used, they were more basic. It didn't matter what you did. Like some of the earlier stuff I've seen, it didn't matter what you did. It was going to sound like a tin can regardless. Yeah. You know, the, just exporting it was just crap. Well, FL yeah. Studio, at least vocals can, it comes out pretty damn pure in, in my ears. I don't know, but I don't have the trained yeah. ears you've got. Oh, there's the, I mean, people are like, oh, they all sound the same. And that's not true. At no, all. I mean, no, I, I know. No. I noticed that the new Pro Tools, I mean, just, uh, and of course, I've got the top of the top or whatever. So, uh, but I, I've noticed even a marked difference when I upgraded. I was I didn't think it could get any better. I'm like, well, it sounds clean, but I, there's something about it. It's even better now. You know, there's more headroom or whatever. They 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 always Pro Tools seem to stay always a little bit ahead of everybody else. You know, in terms of Sonics and uh, you know. But I need they, I to mean, take it, like a class on that someday and just just buckle down and say, okay, that's it. I'm gonna. It's want a pain. It. I mean, I'm not gonna lie because I mean, it, you know, Pro Tools has been messing up lately. Uh, you know, Abbott or whatever they've been. You know, some of the updates have had some ridiculous glitches that shouldn't exist with, with a, you know, they invented this stuff. It's like how, the, it's just everybody's, you know, they're releasing stuff. And then, you know, of course, Apple's like, okay, we're going to change to the Apple chip now. And they're like, you know, it's just, it, 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 it. so everybody just like, oh, we're not fixing the glitch until we figure out they're going to change this. And, you know, it's just a big, you know, so that stuff drives me insane, but, uh, but the like I technology said, I mean, drives me insane with that shit too, and that's what I do. You know, I mean, it's like yeah. I know sooner get one thing in, and then somebody changes a full up a, something in the platform that runs the whole thing. It's like now, but you, you know, it's, 
So pretty much for Bernie, you're saying, you know, Pro Tools, but maybe start off with like a, a smaller uh, version of it. Yeah, Just absolutely. Sure yeah, they have some it. inexpensive like introductory type stuff, uh, you know, get you a, you know, I, I'm a real, you know, the uh, there's little focus right scarlets or something. They're like a hundred bucks, you know, get it, you know, and you can do basic stuff with that. You know, the, the only thing like where you get into money is when you start wanting to record acoustic drums because you're going to need loads of mics, loads of inputs and preamps. And, yeah, uh, it, that's the that's the, new mics. the can of worms. <laughs> But it's like, uh, but yeah, everything else you can do, you know, real guitars, real cello, real vocals, real, you know, with a little scarlet. You don't need anything crazy. And yeah, they're clean. You those direct anyway. Yeah, exactly. Too. Yeah. I mean, just and, and mess around and see what you come up with. And, uh, you know, you could do your drums program. If you want to do acoustic drums, just go to, there's two, tons of studios everywhere in the state, country. Uh, so it's like, you know, just go to a local studio who's already got all the mics and stuff. You want to track some real drums and just go in with That's the well rehearsed drummer. Doing. Yeah, that's that, that's what I've been doing. Like, uh, you know, like I'll, I'll have my my uh, my synthetic stuff. But then, you know, when I get, did go to play, I always went to the same places locally. And I just yeah, honestly, we trade things up. You know, I never really paid anything. And, oh, yeah. then, um, and then we trade things up, you know, whatever. But I, I just I'd play it. And that's how I got spoiled on the pearls, honestly, because that's what I always had there. Yeah. Um, but that's what I would do. And then he'd give me the stems, you know, and I yeah. do what I need to do with them. Um, yeah, so, the yeah, I mean, it's. That's a good advice, you know, so start off with something pro, but maybe a little smaller. Make sure it's something you want to do, because like Jamie said, you know, you're going to get into a whole bigger can of worms later on. Like right now, I need new studio mics. Mine got destroyed in, in a flood. Um, so that's why I got I on my wish list. That. I need, oh, dude, I can't, I'm stuck. I'm frozen right now. It's like until I get these new mics, but I got them on my wish list and every show I'm begging for, I'm like somebody buy these things for me, you know? <laughs> um, and you know, I, I kind of, I'm thrown back a little bit because I remember back in the day in the basement, you had that big board and it's like every time something changed out, you had to go in the back and change out like 50 cables and then put them back, you know? <laughs> so so yeah, I we'll you know, have a patch bay now. So. Right, right. And I remember thinking, damn, I'm surprised that the, the, the jacks aren't all fucked up, you know, from doing it over and over again. Oh, um, yeah. But shit. So, you know, but get get ready for the growing pains is my point. Um, yeah, I man. just, uh, there's a, I, one of the main things, I mean, even if you're great at it, even if you're like, I love doing this, there's a little, so much competition now, you know, there's just oh, yeah. everybody... Uh, you know, and I've been a part of it, you know, the creative live and the, you know, the, uh, the URM.com. I've got classes on all that stuff. And it's like, uh, you know, we're, there's so much education out there. So now everybody is trying to be their own engineer, uh, you know, and really there's not a lot of work for the studios, you know, uh, you know, honestly, I question how long I'm going to be able to uh, stay in business. You know, it's like, uh, uh, man, you're, you're, you'll, you'll be long dead. And people are still going. I mean, you're like <laughs> you're like people's favorite hairstylist, dude. You know, I mean, like people, people, you know, there's been different students. Well, let me give your your stuff a spin. See what I can do. I'm like, you know, I just I, I, Jamie's the guy that I go to. You know, yeah. I mean, it's well, just, hopefully that'll carry me through. You know, to a point where I can afford to transition to something else. But I mean, the re reality of it is, like I said, I mean. It's all getting so much easier. The more technology, I mean, eventually somebody's going to come up with an auto mix, and you put in oh, your favorite band. Oh, please, no, don't say that shit, man. And it'll just like no. mix it. I know <laughs> no. it's going to happen. It's just like with guitar no. tone. With guitar tone, you got the Kempers and you got the Axe Effects and all these things, and it's like these tones that we used to have to fight for. You tried to learn how to mic the guitar and how to these the, how our favorite guitarists were getting their tones. We're like, how are they doing this? And now all you got to do is buy the units and plug it in. I'm like, there's the tone. They've captured the tone in this computer box. All you got to do is buy it, plug it in. Like now you don't have to learn how to engineer any guitar tones. Like all that time, these decades I spent uh, trying to learn to engineer the guitar tones from scratch. Now it's a plug -in. And you just, and just plug in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and everything will be like that eventually. It's just like the drums. It's like to get good professional sounds. Now you can just buy a program. They, they've already done the work for you. They already sampled the drums with an SSL console and the and the and, and the tape and all you know all the stuff that makes it sound you know awesome, you know they've already got all the samples. So all you have to do is just just have the plug in and just you know ninety nine bucks well, or whatever. You know what? I was really shocked. There's there's a musician that does a lot of covers, and uh, I think I I might get in trouble if I say it on here. I can tell you afterwards, but um, he's he's doing an amazingly well on youtube doing these cover songs in fact he makes so much money off of it he bought himself a whole new house and recording built a new recording studio and everything off this but i was really shocked to find out that well because he plays the drums in his in his in his videos right and i was yeah. shocked to find out that he very rarely ever plays the drums he just does that in the video yeah and i because it sounds legit to me i mean yeah. 
I can usually tell because I had been mixing synthetic and real so long that I can usually hear it. I couldn't tell. I had no idea. They, there are some plugins out there. I mean, some programs, you know, Joey Sturgis and, the, you know, the Nolly from, you know, Get Good Drums and all that. I mean, there are some of those these programs. I mean, they've got it down, you know, they're, you know, they got the desirable drum sounds uh, on tap. I mean, it's not like, you know, with the drums, <laughs> you, you know, tune, uh, you know, tune track, you know, drums from hell was a big step forward because they were real sounding they were real drums, but the tones weren't the tones we wanted. Uh, you know, the process, they had right. natural, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, more raw type sounds. But then now these, these other uh, people have like, given us the sounds that we've all wanted from our favorite records and stuff. And it's literally, if you learn how to use those per plugins, like you can, it can sound hundred percent legit, you know, uh, you know, mm. granted it's, you know, I still, I'm, you know, obviously it's always better to me with the real thing. If you got a good player, yeah. who's really well rehearsed and, you know, uh, properly tracked in the studio, it's going to have, there's going to be more emotion energy and there's going to be some, something more. So the human element's going to be in there. It's going to help the music connect. Uh, See, Bernie, the so don't, Bernie, don't get a blow up dog. Get a real woman is what we're trying to say. <laughs> yeah. <I> mean, <laughs> to each his own. Some people might like I mean, it. Yeah, it's, it's your own thing. Somebody so those are some good me. points. And and Bernie, I'm glad to see that you watch the shows, obviously, because you said that you, you found Swift through uh, the stream. So, and I yeah, do play you guys every once in a while. And then, and we had one person when I played it once that requested a second time. So, I mean, there was, there was that, um, yeah, I mean, so yeah, I definitely, Bernie, it. keep coming and checking it out. And I hope that advice is good. I'm telling you, whatever this guy tells you is solid. Uh, Sally Sue, how are you, is what she put as her name, from Charlotte, North Carolina. It says two questions. When is Swift doing another reunion? And if you say never, I'm going to scream and frighten <laughs> my husband. Next question. Do you have Swift merch I can still get my hands on? Uh, well, uh, we don't know, honestly, like we planned to do a show, uh, in 2020, we were going to try to do some type of a uh, festival type thing, uh, but obviously, uh, you know, COVID had other plans and, uh, you know, they had to shut down and all that. So, uh, but yeah, since that, you know, that was the last time we had discussed about, you know, doing any shows, um, and things of that nature. So, uh, everybody's busy, you know, the guys are Gary's down in Florida, you know, Billy's still up in New York really? and, uh. Oh, yeah. I thought it was the other way around. I thought Gary was in New York and, and Billy was in Florida. No, yeah, that. yeah, Gary moved. Well, yeah, Gary, Gary's actually from Florida, so he uh, he just moved back to Florida. And uh, Taylor just took on a job. He's teaching for UNCG now. Last I heard, uh, a teacher. Uh, yeah, he's he's an, What the uh, hell is he teaching? <laughs> he's a college professor in chemistry. He's got his no doctorate. Shit. Yeah, he's so. got his doctorate. Oh yeah, yeah. He's done TED talks and all kinds of stuff, dude. He's. A, there, he's a dude. Have you told him that's not what musicians do? We don't do. <laughs> you know, we don't go get our doctorates. <laughs> no, hey, that's great news. I'm proud. But you know what? I mean, let's go ahead and let the people know the truth. I mean, you know, we're not here to lie. The truth is, uh, Sally Sue, how are you? Um, Swift can't do a reunion show because uh, they they've been asking me to be their new lead singer, and I had to say no. You know, like, and I just. I mean, they, they, you know, and they agreed I'm too good looking for the band. And so, <laughs> uh, of course, I'm lying, obviously, but um, I, that's all I need is for somebody to take. No, this actually work out. Right? Like, like I said earlier, I broke my wrist, so we would have been able to do this, uh, these shows anyway, you know, uh, right. um, in, the, in, in the fall of 2020. So I don't know. I mean, we'll see what's on the horizon. We've been talking about trying to get back together and uh, see what we can come up with. I don't know we'll do any more new swift music i feel like the swift fans probably want material that is more normal you know more similar to our old material and uh you know we're all personally just uh you know into different style you know we're not listening to the same stuff and influenced by the same style of music at this point you know this has been 20 years so uh, what that can make you you know all of us in blister were in a completely different genres um yeah that's we kind of meshed it together. Now I know you guys already have your element, you know, yeah. so that's your thing. I know that if if as a fan going to a Swift show, which it just still makes me sick, I had to miss that last one. And I I was gonna go film it and everything, um, but um, I I think I would be interested in hearing, of course, the old stuff because that's what was, you know, for yeah. nostalgic reasons. But also, I'd be real curious to see what kind of sounds would come out as a new thing, you know. Yeah, what, that's, what I mean, we discussed yeah. that. I, I mean, like I said, I I don't I can't remember if I've even discussed this with the guys, but I've fantasized about possibly doing. You know, a lot of bands are doing these like, uh, uh, you know, you know, playing the whole albums all the way through. I thought about doing like 
you know, we have our first two albums, which is like kind of the new <laughs> metal. sweet, dude. <laughs> yeah, like Thoughts or Thought, Waging War era, which is a certain sound. You know, it's a new metal type of, uh, that was during the new metal era. And then we kind of went to more of our thrash roots on, uh, you know, on the communication manual and the worst, I mean, the, uh, uh, the absolute controllable. And maybe do a show of just the first two albums and play those, and maybe another show of the next two of the next two albums. I thought would be neat for the fans of those particular, you know, areas. You know, uh, the new record, like I said, it was like a, you know, it was just an amalgamation of all the, you know, different styles of music that we, you know, and, and leftover material that we'd had from back in the day. And uh, you know, I, I, like I said, I think that the majority of fans they either like the Waging War Thoughts of Thought era. Or we got the split that like the uh, communication manual, uh, absolute controllable era, and then the new albums kind of like doesn't appeal to either one of those. Uh, I loved that it, much. Man. I thought it was great that whole that whole medieval kind of battle thing going on, you know. Yeah, we had some fun stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like I said, I mean, we, you know, that was just kind of like you know, uh, like I said, those are a lot of old you know, ideas and things like that. But you know, there, there was a lot more serious, uh, you know, political, you know, subject matter in the vocals and things like that. You know, Gary's just in a different place mentally. You know, he didn't have the, you know, the demons that he had when he was a kid. So, you know, things like that. Us, we have new demons. Yeah, you know, exactly. Arthritis. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, now they're old, <laughs> old, old person demons. The pain and, and shit. You know? <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> but also that was back in the day when you could talk about politics and even, you know, stand your ground and it didn't bring the snowflake no, craziness, yeah. you know? Yeah. People were either with you or they'd be like, ah, you know, I don't agree with it, but it's still a kick-ass song. Today, you'd have pitches and torches, you know, pitchforks and it's, torches. Yeah, it's you know crazy I mean? these days. It's nuts. Um, but so the other part of the question is, uh, can uh, she wants to know if you can still, if she can still get some, get her hands on some merch. The only thing we have, we have some CDs left. So, so the new CD, the uh, uh, the worst of all things possible. We do have a few CDs. I know Tribunal Records still has some on their site, I believe. And uh, so if you're interested in any in getting, you know, any of the physical CDs, I know some of those are still available, but I think we're technically out of all t-shirts. Uh, we oh, were lucky. shit, because I was wanting one. <laughs> we can get you more. I mean, you know, Crow, we can hook it up or whatever. But, right. Um, Dude, I'm starting this whole new collection. I'm trying to collect all these band shirts again. I feel like I'm, like I'm 18 or 19 all over again. I find myself getting these band shirts like crazy. I love them. And, you know, I have, I have stacks and stacks. Of course I keep, you know, I gain weight, I lose weight, I gain weight. It's like, you know, it's like, I can't wear half the shirts that I have. I at the feel moment, you, man. I feel <laughs> you. I'll lose weight and I'll be able to get back into it. But, uh, dude, but I yeah. have my, my fat guy drawer, my skinny guy drawer, my <laughs> medium guy drawer. You know, it depends on what my old ass body decides. It just wants to be like one day. And yep. <laughs> then I do that. Yeah, I, just get, um, I get busy and stressed, and I start eating, <laughs> and, you know. Yep, sitting at the computer, and then those Twinkies are it's awful. The, that's another thing about being an audio engineer, whoever's interested in that. you got to understand, it is not a healthy thing to be doing. You know? like, <laughs> it's not, there's no cardio in that. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I mean, unless you get a treadmill while you're Dang. editing or something, there's just uh, <laughs> yeah. I know. I think there's a way to do it. I just wasn't responsible. You know, I, you know, I had a bunch of financial uh, stuff that forced me to, to work more than I really should have, but uh, you know, I was doing like 70, 80 hours a week for like you know 10 years or whatever. That's, I mean, that's you, say the, you were the busiest guy in music I know. Yeah. I mean, it's like yo, but I'm don't just, do that. Don't I'm telling people like <laughs> you, you think you're gonna get ahead and it never happens. And uh, yeah. uh, so now I'm trying to balance and things have gotten better, you know. Now that I've got you know Tommy from BT Bam is my manager now, and he's really helping uh helping really me stay, stay yeah, he's been my manager for quite some time. But he's really he's helping like keep things balanced, you know. Because I'm a yes man, I, you know. All my clients are my friends now. When they hit me up, they're like, "Hey, I want to record." And I end up like giving them all my weekends, and you know, next thing you know, I'm like, I haven't had a day off in six months. Kind of stuff happens, and uh, so with him, he doesn't know anybody, so he just he does the management job. He's like, "These are the dates I have available," and take it or leave it. So I'm finally getting my weekends off. And, uh, well, good, you know, man. You deserve them anyways. You know, I had no choice. I mean, it's like, it literally I got to the point where like, okay, I'm on the precipice of, uh, you know, being bed ridden, ridden. So if I don't, Damn. yeah, I mean, it's, it, health has been, you know, anxiety through the roof and ended up in the hospital with panic attacks. And, uh, 
it's just not good to work 78 hours a week. And that's just a, well, man, I hate to hear that, especially a guy like you. I mean, I know I went through my times with that and I've even told you about it. And I'd sometimes I'd have a lot to drink to deal with it. And I would tell you about it, you yeah. know, I'd send you an email. I'd be like, yeah, man, this fucking sucks, dude. And you'd be like, what's wrong now? <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, my life is over. <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> we all go through it. You know, I think yeah. everybody does, you know, but, uh, you know, like hindsight's always twenty twenty, as they say. And I'm trying to, you know, I know a lot of young, hungry, you know, audio engineers and you know, people who are like, hey, this is what I want to do for a living. And, you know, just like myself, you know, I thought I got to just work really hard to figure this out and get my name out there and do this and that or whatever. But, you know, it's not worth sacrificing personal relationships and your health or any of that stuff. Just keep it balanced, you know, just do your 40, you know, 50 hours a week at most, I think, you know, and it's, uh, you know, luckily there's no labels in ne- now, you know, hardly, uh, at least I don't deal with a whole lot of labels, you know, like, uh, years ago it was, you know, over half of my work w- w- was with, uh, record labels and they all had deadlines and oftentimes there were crazy deadlines Oh fuck! that deadlines, were, that were exacerbated by bands coming in unprepared. And then I would have to do, you know, 20, 22 hour days just to meet deadlines. And it was killing me. Like it was just. I would do a project. It's, it's no good on your mental health. And it's no good on a band either, because I'm going to tell you right now, I could, I could rant like a mofo on that shit, man. Because like right now, the album I'm working on is eight months past due. And that's yeah. the last album I have on my deal, my crappy freaking deal. It's never going to give me anything worth substantial. Right. But I'm eight months. And every time they give me crap, I'm like, that is not helping. That yeah. is not helping. I'm not going to do it any better by you telling me let's hear something. I'll send you the same two tracks I got done six months ago, and there's something. That's it. You know, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I get it from the label standpoint. A lot of times, how the industry st- structured is kind of messed up. I mean, you have to run, have to set up your distribution like months and months in advance, and all this yeah. other stuff. And 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 I get it, you know. But uh, same time, you know, it's like, you know, I got roped into doing because BT Bam being my most popular band. You know, most of the art <laughs> that comes to me is uh, most of the artists that come to me are progressive styles which is the most difficult to re- to record and produce and edit you know and most time consuming of any style of music out there period so it's like but then the labels they don't see a distinction between a hate breed style band versus between the bear and me and it's like dude this <laughs> right. i can do a hate breed record in two weeks you know <laughs> you know record you know, edit mix master to the to the top you know and uh BT Bam takes six weeks, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, well, there's a lot, there's a lot more to what exactly. they do. I the, mean, label, the labels don't reckon that back in the day, they didn't recognize there's a difference. And, uh, and that was what was really causing the problems. And you know, you me being the yes people, person. Right. You know, well, I, you I just, are definitely a gracious guy. I mean, you've never, ever turned me down for any help, you know? And sometimes I felt bad asking too many times, like, all right, so I'm going to ask another tweak on this after 20 times. And, you know, I'm like, biting my nails like he's gonna kick me in a damn fucking face <laughs> but now, you know you're right and now a lot of people don't and it makes me wonder how a lot of people get into those jobs not understanding that shit how did you get yeah. to be the head of deciding all this stuff about bands and four bands when you don't understand dick about what's going on back in the backseat you know uh, yeah i don't know they, they really don't i mean it doesn't matter you know the owners like they just look at the bottom line and obviously you know by forcing people to meet deadlines and things like that, it helps to meet the bottom line. And it, you just never hear about that. But a lot of it, you know, I should, you know, I just need to, you know, I needed to learn to say no to people. And I did learn to just be like, you know, Hey, it's, you know, cause at the end of the day, music is, this is, this is for fun. This is a hobby. This is like, supposed to be. It's yeah. It's not, to nobody's going to die. If the record like doesn't baseball. come out, come you know, out it's this a- week, you know, it's, it can come out two weeks from now. Like, just like yeah. I'm, I'm not losing sleep, you know. And it's, yeah. I don't, when no I was younger, I, I would, yeah. When I was longer, I would just sacrifice my own health and happiness and my family's relationships and everything. Like I said, it was, you know. I mean, well, just, you uh, get you get tunnel vision on it too, you know. I mean, and, yeah, and my, my th- it's OCD it. for me. It's it's a disorder. Yeah. It was a disorder. More, so I think every me. musician has OCD. I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. hell bent on that. I really think we all have that shit, man. I, yeah, really I just do. would not stop until I was done. You know, I just would not stop, and it was like you know, no matter my body was telling me, dude, stop. You know, my family, my mom was like, you're gonna burn out. I'm like telling you, I'm like, oh, I'll be fine. You know, that's what my my emails, Machine JK, and my you know. Part of it's, you know, Gary set my email up and he's like, a lot of part of it was like, I would just work all, I mean, I would go 16, 18 hours, you know, in the studio, you know, you know, in the, in the basement, you know, working on stuff and like, dude, you're like a machine. Like you just never stop. You know, it's just yeah. like, 
And it, you well, know, I pride, I prided on myself on that when I was younger, but then it just as I got older into my thirties, it started catching up with me. And next thing I know, I'm like, you know, it's very unhealthy <laughs> and mentally and physically. And uh, so I'm trying to uh, trying to turn it around somewhat now. It's just a, a matter of being able to. It's a double edged sword. I got to have time to turn it around, but at the same time, I got to work enough to pay the bills and. You know, you know that's, that's really so. something that you all have to think about. Anybody thinking about getting into this or doing, you know, any kind of, you know, computer work too. I, anything where you're sitting most of the time, you, you've got it. You've got it. You really, you know, and the thing is, I feel like I'm saying something to, to maybe somebody that's younger that that I wouldn't have. I would have been like, yeah, okay, whatever. I feel like Superman right now. But the yeah. thing is, is, it's true. I mean, you know, the I my live show, I literally fell out, hit the ground, passed out. And on camera, that was humiliating. And I was <laughs> building this place, you know, oh. and I was doing shows and doing reaction videos and writing my recording my album and then building this place and then doing shows. And I was one well, sleep and I was working myself to death. And I'm like, I'm 47 years old. What am I doing? You know, and I got you up get to a certain point. Wow. Yeah. And that was it's, it. Yeah. I mean, you're young. Like I said, your perspective is different because you feel differently and you, you get at a certain yeah. age. And then, like, like you, you still put yourself. I mean, I still put those same pressures and things on yourself. And, you know, my, it took me a while to realize, like, man, I can't perform like I used to. Yeah. You know, I can't do uh, records as fast as I used to do. And uh, I just have to do what I can because I don't want to I don't want the quality to suffer. I want to always do the best job I can do. So it's like right. I'm definitely not sacrificing that. Um, you know, it's a uh, tough pill to swallow. But really, you know, the only thing I can say is. Think about it now for you younger people that are getting into this. I mean, even people that say, you know, what well, you sit in a chair, you don't do anything but rock and roll with your shows. And honestly, the best exercise I do is I'm always headbanging and dancing in this chair, but and, and that's the best cardio I get is my shows that I do. I yeah. mean, you 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 all really got to think about that. If you're thinking about getting into stuff like that, like he said that, any kind of computer work where you're sitting, you got to think about yeah, I just, that. Yeah, <laughs> I just, I force myself to go walk, you know, every day or every other day, yeah, at least man. ride bikes, whatever, you know, it's just, I'm, I'm forcing myself to do it now. And it's good for my kid and stuff like that too, but it's, uh, it's really a lot better for my mental state, but it just, yeah, it takes time out of my day, which sucks. You know, I know I've got some clients who are probably waiting on their record right now thinking like, uh, get off the computer, <laughs> get off this <laughs> interview and, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> and get back on my record. But it's a, I mean, you gotta have, <laughs> You know, uh, you know, you got to pace it or whatever. Otherwise, you gotta, you gotta the product's going to be man. the product's yeah. going to be down, and then you know, I'll be I, I'll be out of the game if I don't play my play it safe at this point. You know. Well, you know, you're you're the most responsible guy I know with music and stuff. So I'm sure you you know you're going to get that. You it sounds like you're already on your way there. Uh, but that being said, before we piss off your clients, let's get to the next. We got three <laughs> more questions here. You good? Uh, they, some of these people are coming up with some funny names, dude. And it's funny on my show that they do that shit too, but. Uh, Tom the bomb a d bomb bomb. <laughs> boom shika boom boom shika boom. <laughs> uh, from the crap shoot in L.A. California. That's exactly how it's written out. California. What band was the most fun to record? And what is the best tip you can give for me? My, well, you can give me for miking my drums to record because the dude recording now fucking sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I need to tell him a pro tip. I love it, dude. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I fire your engineer is the first thing I'd say. If he sucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If he's, yeah, if he's not even good. Yeah. It's probably just get another guy, but yeah. Uh, as far as fun bands, I mean, I, I, mean, I really don't know. I don't know who has a, uh, you know, I've, a lot of bands I have is enjoyable. Yeah. There, I, mean, I, I will say it was definitely more fun for me back in the day. Uh, recording uh, new metal and rap rock and all that stuff because the band just came in, we set up, we mic'd, and you played, and we did some overdubs and we did a mix, and it was yeah, over. Man. Yeah, I mean, it was just like there was no, you know, it's not a, all this editing. There was no, you know, there's not a lot, you know, a million layers and stuff. And it was, you know, it was just right. the more enjoyable aspects of, of, of recording and production. Now, nowadays, like I said, I mean, it's just like, you know, I enjoy, I really do enjoy editing, like quantizing drums and tuning vocals and things like that. There's something that feeds my OCD about that stuff, but it's not fun. You know, it's not like, yeah. oh, I can't wait to spend eight hours doing, this, <laughs> you right. know, tuning, tuning these four songs. You know, it's like, it's, you know, <laughs> so I think all the projects now have stuff that's not fun and they do have stuff that is fun. And it's, you know, it's always rewarding and fun when everything comes together. You know, obviously 
I think BT and Bam, of course, always bring them up or whatever. They're, you know, always fun to record because they're my brothers. You know, it's like the, from, you know, we've been it, you know, from day one or whatever. And it's like uh, some of the best musicians, super cool dudes. Uh, we keep coming. It's like a family reunion every time we get together to do a record. So it's a, uh, nice. you know, it's like that, that, that family feeling like getting caught up in, in, you know, just, uh, Hanging with the boys again. Yeah. Well, and you've got all that never, a genius in there. I mean, it's like, you know, I mean. Well, it's not even rap- that. You know, to me, it's like, even if they weren't good. I mean, it's like, they're so cool. <laughs> just fun guys. And their right? stuff is, you know, even though like, I didn't like the music, I, but I do. I love, you know, they're you know, some of my favorite music, honestly. Um, uh, but at the same time, it's like, like I said, it's just, they're cool dudes. They're real down to earth guys. And they're, you know, it's like, uh, uh, they're just fun to be around. They're funny as shit. They're they're you know completely reasonable about everything, and it's like uh, you know to me that makes it an enjoyable uh, situation. And I've had other That's bands good. who are amazing musicians, but they're not reasonable people about things, and they make it miserable. They're they're too serious about stuff. Or nah. then you got the flip side of bands who are just not good or not serious enough, and they're kind of like wasting my time and their time. And it was just like so you know I like that. You know, there's there's some bands that I've recorded who are you know who are just in the middle. You know, it's like, hey, let's get together, let's enjoy making a record, let's do something that means something artistically, and uh, you know, uh, try to capture some performances. They come in prepared, and uh, you know, it's all it's all uh, enjoyable. But it's you know, I would say half half of my projects are like that, the other half are not. You know, it's just like it's and it's uh, you know, sometimes they bunch up. You know, it's like three miserable three months of miserable products and projects in a row, and then. <laughs> three months of good projects you know it just there's no rhyme or reason over the years uh, well, i can i can definitely tell why you, why you would probably get that that vibe like <laughs> those guys from uh, between the bury me call up and you're like yes thank god please come over i'm just heading to nothing but three months of shit luckily recently the past couple of years it seems like almost everybody's been cool there's hasn't hardly been any like nice. Super negative people. And that's my main thing. I don't even care if I like the music. I'm like, dude, I don't think what you're doing is good at all, but you're super cool. And, uh, right. you know, so I enjoy this. You know, I'm going to try to help do the best job I can do for what you're going for, you know. But, you know, I, I would rather that than have a band like, I love the music, but you guys suck as people. Right. You know, because right. I'm spending time with you and, I, you know, I don't want to spend a month of my life with somebody who's just miserable and makes me feel anxiety oh, and stress. It's like a bad day. marriage, you know. I mean, yep. I... You know, and I'm, you're stuck. I'm, you have a contract. Yeah, you're, you're right. You're stuck yeah. with them. It is like a marriage. You it, know? I mean, it is, yeah, for literally. Except without the, I mean, you may have some blow up dolls. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> 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 um, but I mean, you know, I, I always looked at like musicians a lot, like you know, and I, I might get some people upset at me for saying this, but I, you know, what, I'm not gonna say. I mean, women are the only ones I have as a reference because you know I'm straight. But I would yeah. say it's the same thing for guys. And everything else personality can ruin everything. Oh, you yeah. know, I've, I've been on some dates with women I thought were absolutely beautiful, but by the end of the date, I thought they were horribly ugly because it's yeah. just their personality. Shit. Same thing you go with musicians. They can ruin their whole fucking thing. You know, yep. I mean, there's nothing worse than a fucking prima donna garage band. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, they, they, they're like, Oh, we got six people that come to our garage and watch us. We're the yeah. shit. You know, yeah. I mean, there's, I've even had some that, that come up to me every once in a while and they, they, they have no idea I've done anything. And they're like, you know, like I, I talked on the, the last show I did about this singer that was, he was trying to tell me about, he just, he looked like he was putting so much work into his uh, screams and it was just fry screaming. Right. And I was just, I was with a buddy and we were watching their band thing and I was just watching. And I said, I said, dude, why, why you look like you're going through so much hell? You know, I'm thinking he already knew who I was or whatever locally here, you know, but he's like, oh, man, well, that's because I'm a singer, dude. I've been doing it for six months. You know, we know these kind of things. You got to really push yourself. And I'm like, <laughs> You're talking like, to, like, dude, I've been doing this for my, like all, your whole life. Probably. Yeah, I, since since you were a glimmer in your daddy's nutsack, you know, but <laughs> I mean, but I, I played along with it. It's like, oh, OK. So, you know, it's, you got experience. Like, yeah, man, I mean, like when you're a singer, you know, these kinds of things, you know. And then he's like, watch, I'll show you. And he grabbed the mic. He's like, Rah! And his face was like, I thought he was going to start busting out and pimples and shit on, right? Like his eyes were going <laughs> to pop out. And he's like, he's like, man, see what I mean? You got to push. Like, you know, he's telling me this shit. Like, I don't, I was like, oh man, I, well, you know your stuff, dude, you know? And I grabbed the mic. I said like this and I made funny. I, and he was so mad, but I made a mockery of the guy. I couldn't help oh, yeah. it. But I grabbed the mic and I was like, Rah! 
<laughs> and I said, so you really don't have to put yourself through that, man. You let the damn take care of it. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anyways, I tend to do that. I go off on my own tangents about shit. Sorry. Oh, it's relevant. It's relevant. But yeah, as far as the drum micing thing, uh, uh, that's, I mean, like I said, there's just specific mics that I like or whatever and uh, use, but it's pretty standard stuff, whatever. Sheer I'm Beta 91. Curious. What 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 is your prefer? I mean, I'm partial to sure across the board for everything. Yeah. What's your yeah, preferred I, drum mic? Yeah, I, I still like I said sure beta ninety one, you know, for most of the punchy metal rock stuff. If you want a good attack, whatever inside the kick, I still use a uh uh yeah, I'm using a Yamaha sub kick on the outside now or a, a sheer beta fifty two, uh depending on what type of vibe uh depending like the uh, sub kick just kind of uh gives a rounder fatter type of uh a blow end or whatever, and uh, this Beta ninety two uh, carries the same lower frequencies, but they they have a little tighter for attack. So it depends on the kick drum and desired sound. Uh, but usually just two mics on the kick snare. I still do the. Uh, I'm actually using a Beta fifty seven <laughs> on snare because it has the the hypercardioid for maximum like hi hat rejection. Oh, really? Stuff. Yeah. Uh, fifty seven still works great on snare. I mean, it's a standard. Man, drum. fifty seven is a classic, though, man. I mean, yeah. You know, it's so beta 57, uh, you know, I, ideally 57 works awesome too. Uh, on the bottom snare, I'm still using a beta 57. Uh, it's got that 8K boost as opposed to the 5K boost or whatever, but a 57 works great on the bottom snare too. Again, both, all these are industry standard things. I do use Sennheiser 906s on the Toms or 904s. Really? Sorry. Yeah, they're, uh, you know, the Sennheiser 421 is like kind of like, you know, a long time industry standard for Toms. Um, okay. And uh, but they're you know they're they're, they're designed for broadcast mics so they have like a low roll off and they're huge so they're hard to position. So uh, a guy that I know who works at Sennheiser basically told me he's like, hey man, the the nine hundred fours have the same diaphragm as the four twenty one, so it, they literally sound identical. I didn't believe it. I bought them and I a b them. I'm like, these sound identical. Uh, no shit. So yeah, and they're, they're the clip on deal or whatever. It's not the 604. The 604 doesn't sound, there's a little more boxy. They can work too, but the uh, the 904 are the ones that sound like the, they're the exact same sound as the 421. And they're more positionable. They're smaller. They clip on the drum. And, and that's uh, a big thing. You don't want a bunch of clanky shit while you're trying to play. Yeah, well, especially most of the metal drummers these days, they they set up for ergonomics. They, there's no space between cymbals, you know, for, you know, so you, you got, you know. Uh, so no, you no, see, it. that that that's about, I like, roomy you know i don't care if it takes up too much space i want that's actually better sounding yeah the drum like you know i always set myself because i'm big and i you know i spread you know um i'm I spread out anyway i play right and left handed uh, play you always did kind of play wide anyways though you yeah. did like a sweeping motion on your cymbals you know which yeah. is kind of different but it sounds people. better like you like it's yeah. hard as a producer as a mixer to deal with if you've got loud cymbals in the toms and snare mics, you know, it's like you can't gate them out and stuff. And it's yeah, like, it so if you have your cymbals much. far away, like they did back in the eighties, back in the eighties, they put them way far away so that right. the analog gates would work. Uh, it wasn't just for looks. It was literally so the, the cymbals wouldn't open the gates on the tom. Yeah. So, <clears throat> well, once um, that bleeds in, you can't take it out. You exactly. Know I mean? Yeah. So it's tough. I mean, there's, there's tricks nowadays. I mean, you can kind of work with ergonomic cymbal setups, but, uh, it's uh it's difficult, but th those mics really help with that. Uh, I still use a you know a Shure SM eighty one on the on the hi hat and ride. I'm using the uh, Neumann you know uh, I guess what is it K one eighty fours. It's the industry standard like pencil condensers by Neumann or whatever. Kind of not cheap, but uh, they sound amazing on the cymbals or whatever. I still use a couple of those or overheads, and I've got I've honestly got some pretty inexpensive Rode pencil condensers like a couple hundred bucks a piece that I Rode. use. For, yeah. I, I had old. one of those ones. I did, I thought it was crap, man. I, I don't, maybe are, I maybe I just was using it wrong, which I don't know. Well, the, the good thing about those things, they're inexpensive and they're just super razor flat. <laughs> they have no height, you know, at all. They, you know, That's they, true. You That's wouldn't true. listen they're to them and be like, out. "Oh, this sounds great on this." I mean, it's like it doesn't flatter anything. But right. like I said, I, I use them specifically for uh, spot miking. They're really directional and like stuff like splashes and my china symbol and all my little accent stuff that I might want. To, to boost in the mix. Like I'll mic them with these Rhodes mics or whatever. And it, and they work great because like I said, they just, uh, they just, uh, they're just, I don't run them in the mix at all times. It's only if somebody hits a splash and I want to be able to bring it up, then I'll, the, you know, if the overhead's not enough, then I'll, then I'll bring in this road mic or whatever. But I'll, I'm I'll, I'll, have to, 
send you send you that that uh, set that I was looking at of, of drum mics, and maybe you can uh, tell me what what I should get instead for a couple of them. Because I mean, I've always taken everything you said as gold. Like it, to to record my vocals, I, back in the the first basement, you had this Shure SM58 Beta. Yeah, I still use that. Still That's use great that, uh, for all my mics. I mean, yeah, my apparently, vocals. from what I understand, Bono from U2 uses that mic. He could use any. Mike in the world, he still uses the Beta 58 in the studio. Yeah. You know, it's, it just it. always came out the best for me, you know. And, and I th I've th wondered, well, yeah, is that just because that's what you've always been? But no, I, it's, I've used plenty of other mics in that Beta 58 for recording. Well, it's just like, um, you know, James Hett, James Hetfield, people who do kind of harsh vocals, like the dynamic mic kind of rounds out and smooths out that harshness, makes yeah. it a little more, uh, you know, makes your diction a little more, cl uh, you know, smooth naturally and. That's why a lot of people love the, the Shure SM7 and the, and the beta and, and the 58. The, the Shure SM7 has the same element as the regular 58 and the regular uh, 57, to my knowledge. It just has some sort of, sort of EQ circuit. So it's well, literally the live, same way. The live yeah. stuff I still use, it's a wireless, but it's still the 58. 58 yep. a beta for live too because yeah the beta is great because it's got a hot you know it's got it's it's got more gain it's hotter it'll pick you know you can walk yep. around for studio purposes especially uh you can you can be more off of it like oh, a regular 58 hot. yeah regular 58 is not quite as hot you have to be right on it and it's got you know right. a little bit different eq so but honestly i mean in reality with drums like i said i mean honestly you give me all 57s i can mic up a drum kit and i can eq it and make it work you know what I'm saying? It would sound good and professional. Um, you know, really people give too much. Uh, you know, I've learned that the mics aren't as important as I used to think they were. Like I used to think I have to use a 57 on the guitar and blah, blah, blah. And I got into the EQ matching thing and I've realized like the mic is super subtle, like differences or whatever. Like you could mic with a, you know, a $5,000 condenser or, a, you know, a 57 and EQ match it. And in the mix, it would almost be indistinguishably different. You know, really? if, you, if you just EQ matched it. Yeah, I mean, like, I've got that DUI Magic Spectrum, and it uh, it matches up to 500 EQ, the 512 EQ points. And Jeez. it's like, so basically, like, you know, it's just like the voicing of the mic affects it naturally. But if you match that up, that's how that's how all these modelers work. The amp modelers and these mic modelers and stuff, all they're doing is matching up the EQ. It's like they're taking one mic, and, and they, they've got a saved – EQ profile of the other mic, and they 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 just um, you know they just uh, co compensate for the difference. Oh. Yeah, and then literally it sounds like the other mic, you know. And it, it's crazy how there's like a thousand different mics. That out there. really is wild, man. Because I've always you know I've always been solid on this mic is making this happen, but I guess maybe not. <laughs> it, 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 well, it's like I said, there's a difference. I mean, there, don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, well, like if you got a Radio Shack, you know, five dollar microphone, obviously, you know, that's yeah, gonna be, there's know. a certain level. It's like, okay, now this is just you know, like an MXL. I mean, most of that's just going to be garbage, and right? You're going to be able to hear that, but it's like you know, there's you know, certain like I said, I, I've got a you know the the two hundred dollar Rode mic or whatever, and and if I EQ match with my Neumann U87, which is a thirty five hundred dollar mic, it's like. The difference, the U87 has a transformer in it, so it's like it adds a little bit of heat and distortion to the tone, so it makes it hotter and warmer. But if you EQ match it in the mix, you can barely hear the difference, especially if you run the road through like one of my transformer preamps and, and like crank and boost the preamp a bit uh, to get that transformer saturation on it. It's like, I mean, it's such a subtle difference. It's just crazy how it just you know that much money difference, and it's it's yeah, really. So, sorry, you remember when I just had a flashback? Remember the tube screamer? Oh yeah, <laughs> the vocals. <laughs> I still, yeah, I still, I use a, a version of that in my mixes all the time. Still, no shit, y'all. Yeah. If you don't know what I'm talking about, we literally ran Vox through Vox. this guitar pedal. It's this little green guitar pedal, yeah. and it was called the tube screamer. And yeah. just for this one effect, and honestly, I I, I totally ganked the, the the sound from Swift because uh, Gary used it a lot, and I was like, I want that for this part or this part. And he pulled out this guitar pedal, and <laughs> you know, obviously, that's not the best practice now because it's you know, once it's in there, it's in there. You can't take that out. Well, yeah, you want to make exactly. sure yeah, now I add it on the back side if I want it kind right. of deal. And uh, but yeah, I mean, that's I mean, still a um, you know for that sound. I mean, of course, I. I don't, I don't, I don't know if anybody else used the tube screamer. I'm sure somebody used the tube screamer, but yeah, other people were using drives on vocals back then. You know, like Chino for Deftone. You know, like uh, Terry Davies. Oh, yeah. 
it, uh, you know, hostile from Pantera had a distortion yeah. on there. And it, yeah, that was our kind of thing. Story. Well, my thing was that, you know, because Gary, he went from a, a talk whisper thing to a scream. So the dynamic was so broad. So we almost right. didn't have a, 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 a way to get that clear in the mix without adding overdrive and really brick walling it and, and literally just going ahead and distorting it. And it was like, because Gary didn't need distortion for his scream. His scream was ridiculous anyway. But Oh, it was yeah. Like, my God. It was crazy. But yeah, the, the the distortion thing kind of smoothed the screams and the and the whisper stuff out to one even level, and it was like you know, it was cool sound. I mean, a lot of people during that era were doing stuff similar. You know, obviously, I not, was too you know, live. Had, I had, had the drive uh, Digitech uh, RP12. I did a, yeah. I, I, yeah, a guitar cool. pedal I use live. Now all, I run uh, the TC Helicon Voice Live thing because it's yeah. made for vocals. You know, so you don't have yeah. that that feedback quite as bad. Yeah, it's um, tough with feedback. Yeah. So to answer your question, Tom, I, you know, there's a lot of different choices with drum mics, but I think as far as like, those uh, are the ones I use. Yeah. And I use whatever works for room mics. You use a 57. I use a road. I've used, I've got some KS, some sheer KS 27s. Um, honestly, you're just looking for some, uh, you know, room reflections for the room mic. So, but that's all I use. And it's uh, honestly, like I said, about, you can almost use anything. What about his pro tip for his uh, engineer that fucking sucks? <laughs> <laughs> if he sucks then then yeah yeah just find somebody else but you know like i said i mean Honestly. maybe he's, maybe he's actually good he's just not good at getting the sounds that you're looking for so he right. might be he might be using exactly the best mics for the sounds that he goes for and uh but you know he's you know like i said it's not that he sucks maybe just but find somebody who's doing you know if you want a mcdonald's cheeseburger go to mcdonald's don't go to taco bell and ask for mcdonald's right. cheeseburger thank you thank you they can't you know that they can't do that <laughs> Right. You know, you get, get to the studio that, that, that you're, that you're most compatible with is, is what I, what I would think, you know I mean? Cause it's kind of like, you know, I'm going to use the hairstylist thing again, because my mom was a hairstylist uh, yeah. most of her life. And, um, you know, there, there, she was constantly getting people like somebody would quit being a hairstylist or retire or whatever. And they'd come to her and all of a sudden they were just not compatible. And she's like, well, you know, I'm a different kind of hairstylist. Same thing. You know, it's all it's different engineers and stuff like that. Or yep. producers. Um, so we got Jackie. It says somewhere in the center of the USA. That's where she's at. Somewhere in the center of the USA. Uh, should my band always use the same equipment and instruments in the recording studio that we use on stage? Our studio master, master, you call him master. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to be called. I'm not just an I'm a studio master. <laughs> <laughs> We're not worthy. <laughs> Our studio, oh my God, I'm going to laugh about that all night. Our studio master said. <laughs> <laughs> I guess technically you could look at it. Oh he's Matt he's, he's uh, a master of the studio. Uh, you know, I just have this vision of this band all being dressed like I dream of Jeannie. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> master. Um, all right, see if I can get this out. Our studio, the guy said, we need to better, we need better gear than what we use on stage. Possibly. I mean, depending on what you're using on stage. I mean, if you I get mean, up with yeah. some, some Hello Kitty guitar. and um, <laughs> <laughs> It depends on the sound you want, really. I mean, like I said, I mean, uh, you know, I've... Hello Kitty. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> He's going to kill me, y'all. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, I mean, there's there's been times, I mean, I've been... Um, you know, I've learned to be open-minded as far as equipment because I've had clients, you know, as a band called Heads Legend, I recorded way back in the day. Uh, the guy came in, you know, he's like a master guitarist, you know, as far as he's got just the tone in his hands. And he had this crate amp, you know, crates are kind of notorious for just being a, a budget practice amp, you know. And he had this like, he really? had this, uh, uh, they were, uh, they were banned on, uh, they were on Tribunal when, when I worked with them. And then they were on, uh, I think, uh, Tooth and Nail or uh, Solid State I'm, Records. I'm making, I'm making you go off track, man. Anyway, it's no, no, <laughs> no, yeah, but they're they're pretty known band. I mean, they're definitely awesome band. But anyway, I remember he came in the studio and he's like, "I've got this." The one guitar player had a fifty one fifty, which is standard for great metal tone, you know. Right. And the other, and he had this crate with the Sonic Maximizer on it. He was like. <laughs> He's like, I want to use this. He's like, I, you know, I think we, you know, it sounds really good. I worked with it, got it dialed in. I was like, I don't know, man. You know, my instinct was like, let's use the better, more expensive gear because we have right. access to it. But I was like, well, let's just go ahead and hook it up and see what it sounds like. And it's the, it's the amp that's on that record. I mean, it sounded great. He had it dialed in. 
and it blew my mind. It was like, you know, it's it's not it's good because it's not it doesn't sound like everything else, you know. And it's like, right. Uh, and it really worked for that record, I think, at that time. And uh, so I've kind of learned, you know, to be open minded about equipment. Some people come in, and it, you know, if there's some technical problem, if you got a guitar and it will not play in tune. Or something like that, unless you want it out of tune, and it's like obviously you need to get a like better guitar. And go the yeah, I mean some yeah you know, some people want that janky kind of you know if you're doing an alternative type thing or a classic you know, rock thing and you want it to sound a little bit out of tune or crappy or whatever, then you know there's no rules with equipment. But you know I I'm I'm against these studios in like forcing clients to hey use my gear. This is, you're going to use this guitar amp. You're going to use and it's like you know a lot of there's lots of producers and studios out there like that 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 do this and all the records sound the same and it's like dude it's yeah. not it's not <clears throat> the producers art it's the band's art so let them make the choice on the on the on the uh the equipment to use and stuff and it's like i always try to make what the band uses work first i like let's track it yeah, like, luckily, their sound you know yeah I mean. exactly yeah if they have a sound now if they come in or like we don't have we, we don't really have anything i'm digging I always ask the band, like, hey, do you have, is there a record to kind of give me an idea, like, what, what kind of guitar sound you want, what kind of drum sound you want? And then I will give them my knowledge as to what I feel is the best way to get that sound, you know? Right. A, a lot of people, they have gone to Guitar Center and talked to the guy. I'm like, hey, here's the sound I want. What do I need? And the Guitar Center kid will sell them the absolute opposite wrong gear. Right. You know, as happens with drum heads all the time. Like, hey, I want this. <laughs> I want this kind of drum sound and they will like sell them to complete opposite drum head that produces this, uh, the opposite sound from what they actually want. Yeah, and it's see, like, so there you go, I, kids talk to your studio producer, <laughs> not, the, not the guitar center guy. Yeah. A lot of times <laughs> the producer is going to know, have, have more of an instinct, but you know, as to what actually produces the sounds that you're going for. But like I said, there are a lot of producers who are like, they want you to have whatever sound they think is best. It doesn't matter what I think is best in my opinion. Like I, I'll put my opinion out there, but I want to 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 give the client the product that they are paying for, that they're hiring me to to get. If they want right, to sound exactly. a certain way, then it's my job, in my opinion, to try to make it. It's like you go get your car painted. Like, hey, I want this car painted this shade of red, and they're like, No, you want the car green. It's like, No, exactly. I want yeah, it that's, freaking red. Yeah, it's, see, it's that's the vibe I'm getting off this right now. I mean, honestly, <clears throat> you know, I I'm, I want your answer because it's your interview, but the way I'm I, the 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 bad the bad vibe I got off this is I'm thinking this poor Jackie is going to the studio and this engineer or producer, well, this would be production, is is sitting there trying to force fuck her and what to what to sound like, you yeah. know. And I I just think honestly, if you're going to a studio like that. You need to come to North Carolina and hire Jamie or somebody like him, you know, because I mean, really, you shouldn't have that kind of experience in my, it really, I this think, is why I got into re doing production because, you know, my old bands in high school and right out of high school, you know, we had gone from studio to studio and we wanted a specific sound or something in the ballpark of specific sound. And no one would give us the sound we wanted. They either, they, they were like, no, you don't want to sound like that or, or like, like, oh yeah, we, we can make you sound like that, and then it totally don't doesn't sound like that. So either they didn't have the knowledge, or they did have the knowledge and just not the will. And it, like I said, the last studio I went to before I decided just to do it myself was a ninety dollar an hour studio in Charlotte. <laughs> um, great facility, and we worked with a third, uh, you know, third shift engineer guy who just didn't really know what he was doing as far as getting the sounds that we wanted. And uh, and then we had to, we hired this guy to come in and engineer the drums. And, you know, at that time, Pearl Jam was all the rage. So that alternative sound was like, you know, the big roomy drums. And we, right. I wanted to sound yeah. like Metallica or Pantera. You know, I wanted to punch right. you in your face drum. Well, like, I, no, I, I didn't want a lot of room sound. I wanted like a re big, huge reverb on the snare from, the, from a reverb unit. But, I, but he was like mic'd up all the drum room and tried to give me this big... You know, no, 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 that's for Duran Duran and fucking Boy George this was, and shit. Like, it's $90 you know. an hour. And like the dude was, I thought I told him I was like, dude, this is the sound I want. Do you want me to get some CDs and let you hear what I'm going for? He's like, no, that's not necessary. He's like, oh, you don't want that sound. I was like, that's ridiculous. Nah, like, yeah, I am no. paying you. And finally, I was like, okay, we can't afford any more than ninety bucks an hour. We paid thirteen grand, and we didn't end up releasing a record because we didn't like the way it sounded. Fuck. And it was like, I was like, I can't. We can't afford to pay more than this. So it's like the only my, my only option is to like, I know what I want to sound like. My only option is just to buy the gear and do it myself. 
uh, because there were no other studios that we could find that would, would give us the sounds we wanted. You know, no, no local studios producing records that sounded like we wanted to sound. And, um, you know, well, so I care, I care, you, man, you know, well, I can't I mean, forward to this day. I'm one of the few, I think that really like it cares about what the client wants to sound like a lot of big clients. Well, like, luckily, <laughs> a lot of, luckily, a lot of the clients come here and they want to sound similar to other bands that I've recorded. So it's easy. I already know how to do that. They're in the right place. You know, but I have had instances where bands, artists come in and like they want to sound a certain way that I've never done before. Like, I, like, dude, I've never done a record that sounds like what you want it to sound like. But I'll do my best to try to figure out how to make your record sound this way, even though it's not my personal preference, even though I have no idea really or don't have a really good idea of how to get those sounds. You know, I'm really going to try to uh, get it to sound like that way. And a lot of times, you know. This is, this is where people are local and they just want to stay local. They don't want to travel and things, but sometimes it's just better. Like I said, if you can't find somebody who wants uh, to make your record sound the way you want it to sound, then you just need to go somewhere else. You know, that's what, that's what I was going to say. Cause it's like this. I mean, if you're really put Jackie, if you're in a situation to where you're going in there with this idea that you're going to come up with this product that you're going to be happy with. If somebody's trying to force you in a, sounding different you're not going to be happy with your product when you get done with it you're going to waste your time and money and you're going to have a bad a, a recording studio experience should be a an experience that you walk away from and remember for the rest of your life as something awesome you know i mean you shouldn't have go in there and have a bad ex i mean like going into a restaurant eating something and get food poisoning you don't want that shit you know or imagine if you went to you know, a, a restaurant and you said you want a lasagna. I said, no, nah, I think you want pizza instead. You know, you, yeah, I mean, ridiculous. they would fuck you up, dude. Don't, yeah, don't. Jackie, you know, I don't know who your studio is. Go somewhere else. Well, I, mean, I will say, like I said, having said that, I mean, I think it's, a you know, producers, you know, it's, it's they're, they're responsible for like, you know, a lot of times I'll have an idea or an opinion and I will share that. But I always make well, it clear, like, hey, this is my opinion. You guys are the boss. But I think it would sound better if we did this or we use this out. Hey, do you want to try this out? This is not really sounding the way I think you want to sound. It's a, a lot of times, like, to me, it's like, you know, and some, like, 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 you know, if somebody's like, hey, I want to sound like we sound live. I'm okay. Okay. We're going to, we're going to use your equipment and your settings even. And, right. that, you know, what I'm saying that's what it's going to sound like. Um, so that's important. You know, if that's what they say, most of the time bands are, they have their favorite few artists or few records are like, Hey, I want my guitars to sound like this. I want my drums to sound like this. And sometimes oftentimes it's they've, they have purchased the wrong equipment to get those sounds. They're like, Hey, right. I want us, you know, if you say, I want to sound like, uh, I mean, I don't know, like, uh, Jimi Hendrix. No, yeah. If you want to sound like Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, exactly. I, I want my guitar to sound like Jimi Hendrix. I'm like, oh, of course, of course, you know, of course you need a Marshall with, with the strat right. and with the thing. If you come in with a Gibson and you came in with, you know, with a, you know, a fender and no distortion, you know, it's like, it's, that's the wrong <laughs> amp, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, there's, there's instances where my responsibility is to educate them. Like, dude, that's not, you know, look, I, I, but I always do it. It's like, I'll let them hear what they have and then let them hear what I think they should use and let them make the decision still, you know, uh, well, those, but if, if a guy two, is just uh, like, you're going to use this because this sounds better. A lot of times that's the engineer. They're being lazy. They know they can get a good sound with, with the gear they have. They got presets already. You know, when yeah. bands come in and use my drums, they're already tuned up. So it's easier. But if they want to use their kit, I'm like, bring your kit in. We will tune your kit up and we'll use your kit. That way it'll have the right. sound. that It'll have your drum set on there. And, right. uh, you know, but a lot of engineers are like, no, you're going to use the house drums because they sound better. It's like, not necessarily. Yeah, they're, they're just, they just they just want to do that. Like you said, it's, it's easier. easier. They already got it figured out, so they're just yeah. gonna go ahead and do this one. Yeah, they don't want to put the effort into doing a different thing. They've got their EQ presets already set for that kit, and it's just like you know, plug and play for them. And I think that's a lot of the motivation behind that. Right. But, uh, yeah, and Jackie, you, like like you said, if you unless you're using like a Hello Kitty thing, you know, obviously you don't want. To, yeah, obviously there's some. You might want to listen to them, you know. Um, like, hey, this guitar will not play in tune, then it's obviously right. Like, all right. Now, if you if you switch now, if anybody out there is trying to sound like Jimi Hendrix and you switch to the ultimate alt, alternate setup that he just mentioned, uh, you're gonna you're gonna get uh the blues, you know. Yeah. Um yeah. It's, not, it's, it's not gonna be Hendrix. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's just some things, yeah, that just will not produce sounds that you uh right. that, you know, and like I said, people come in with, you know, they'll have a Mesa boogie and they want a tone, they really want it to sound like a 5150, but they're like, I hate PBs. I'm like, well. That doesn't make sense. You want you like 
this tone <laughs> you bought a Mesa of boogie that's not they both sound great but this does not sound like that you know, it, it, you know. i want a cherry coke but i hate coke well <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, you know, but Jackie, at the same time, he's got a good point. I mean, you know, Liz, the producer's job, like Jamie's, is is to give you the best suggestion, you know. I guess it would really depend on what your exact situation is. Because, yeah. you know, of course, anything that this guy says, I'm going to take his gold. But if it's somebody that's just being lazy like that, it's just, you know what? I mean, go somewhere else. That's what I would do. I don't know. I mean, if it's just being lazy and, and – Yeah, you're the boss. If you're, if you're paying somebody, you are the boss, in my opinion. I don't care – you know, you know. Obviously, if there's a label involved, then they are the boss. Unfortunately, right, right. They're, they're the ones paying. You know, what, but whoever's paying is the boss. And uh, so, you know, I would just be like, yeah, yeah. if you really feel, if you really feel the gear that you have is going to give the sound that you want, and and just let him like, hey, let's try my gear. The good thing with recording equipment, like I said, with drums, oftentimes you can use the drums. If something doesn't work out, you can sample blend or sample replace. So it's not the end of the world, you know. Particularly with the kick, snare, and toms. Uh, so you can always change the sounds there to a degree. With guitars, you can always you always record the DI. The engineer always should record DI signals from the in, from the guitar or bass, uh, as a, a, as well as any amp or amp emulated signals. That way, if you need to change any guitar tones later, you can do that. You know, so there's some flexibility. Like I said, you're not just stuck if you use your gear. Uh, the only thing you would be stuck with is whatever guitars you would have to retrack if your guitars. Your pickups didn't sound the way you needed them to sound, or you, they wouldn't play in tune, things of that nature. Uh, and your cymbals, you can't like sound replace cymbals. Uh, so whatever cymbals you use, or what it's going to be on there. Uh, just oh. just pick up the phone and book Jamie King. <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> I'm you know. down with that. Problem solved. Problem solved. All right, here we go. Uh, the last one, uh, Emily from Canada. I saw you with Swift when I was in the states. I also saw Peretti a long time ago at the show. You and the band showed up at after your show, I also have always loved Swift and Peretti. I think she's kissing both our asses right here. Awesome. Um, <laughs> uh, but it was Blister then. Uh, oh, yeah. I I know what she's talking about. She's talking about that show we've talked about before, where you guys showed up after after years. We did, we were next door. Oh, uh, but yeah. that was that was stiff. That wasn't Blister yet. But anyways, uh, his new stuff is amazing, and he credits you for mastering all his work told you uh and thank you i am amazing i'm just saying <laughs> uh, <laughs> so my question is what is the biggest difference from recording back then to now and do you mostly do mastering any new swift material coming soon so there's a two-part question in there i think we covered most of that but anything else you want yeah. to put in there from then to now and uh well actually i think you already answered both of that but is there anything else you want to add to it yeah i mean basically just broadly i used to see it back then was more live recording with prepared material and now it's just more piece by piece uh you know more progressive more elaborate material you know everybody's pushing the envelope as to what they can play and uh, more layers and things like that as far as what i'm seeing anyway uh but yeah it's in as far as swift like i said we don't know i mean we honestly we've talked about getting together we don't know if we'll do more swift <laughs> material or another swift show or any of that other stuff it just uh hey we're just trying to find time to get together you know uh gary and i and uh, Probably Mike, possibly Billy, uh, you know, maybe Taylor or whatever, just depending on, uh, you know, stylistically where everybody's, where we want to go with things. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I really, it's really just uh, super up in the air right now. So, well, there you go. I mean, I know reunions can be tough. I mean, the guys at Blister have been talking for like the last nine years about doing a reunion. It just never pans out. You know, we're all on different pages and stuff like that. But it as costs so much family, money, honestly. Oh, it yeah. does. It's crazy expensive, man. I mean, people yeah, don't a, realize you don't just like, hey, let's just load up the wagon and go to Beverly. It's not like that. You know, I well, mean, it's just the cost in time for me. You know, it's like, you know. You know, losing work. You know, I make three, 300 bucks, give or take a day of work or whatever. And it's like, you know, so, you know, you take out days to, to work on new material and then record it and then practice the shows. I mean, I mean, you add it up. It's like, man, I've got, you know, $50,000 worth of days to do this one show and this one record or what, you know, you it's going to make that 50 grand. And on that's show. Just me, <laughs> you know, the other guys yeah. probably lose even more money. I know Gary, you know, he's, does it work and then tailors i mean so it's like for us to take time off work and do that and then the travel involved you know we got people we're oh, spread yeah. out across the east coast at this point to a degree and uh so there's thousands of dollars in travel and it's like even though we we're lucky to have a good turnout turnouts here in winston and make 
a decent amount of money on that, it's still a drop in the bucket compared to what we have to spend to actually do this thing, you know, and it's just, uh, yeah. if we were all, I think if we are all living locally, like we were when we were kids, you know, then obviously we'd be getting together. We'd definitely have another record. We'd definitely be doing shows, uh, cause the sacrifice would be, you know, significantly less or whatever, but right you know, now with family too, you know, it's just like the time It's just, uh, we all got old, man. You know, I mean, <laughs> well, there's no money to, you know, if, well, you know, part of the problem is with it, the, you know, there's no money to be made on the, on the, you know, selling music anymore. You know, it's like, no. uh, you no. know, when we were doing it, I remember, you know, like we could sell CDs and that would pay for yeah. gas and, and some food and yeah, your things like that. Yeah, and stuff, you know, I mean, that, yeah, that I was, mean, that was where it was at. It, I mean, it was as sure as hell wasn't from just being always, on stage. Or, yeah, that's still that way, you know. I mean, that luckily, yeah. I mean, it's still heavy t-shirt sales and stuff. We were lucky to have a good amount of t-shirts uh, sales and things of that, that nature, but it's still nothing compared to like, you know, the way things used to be with actual album sales and, and whatnot yeah. and uh uh, it's just hard to validate, you know, financially. We were never, we were only popular here in Winston and maybe, a, you know, five hour driving radius, somewhat popular. So it was like, if we were, if we had, if we had, if we had had the opportunity to have a, a, a national or international promotions strategy implemented, I think things might be different. I think there might be enough interest in, in money to make it all make sense. But uh, just for us, it's just like, uh, we just had to do it for fun and, uh, you know, at, at, our, at personal cost, you know, it's it's pretty high. Well, you never know, man. I mean, if if we keep pumping you on the shows that I do, you know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> we need a, any millionaires out there. Just call me up, and get, you know, you can uh, you can <laughs> he, be our record label, and uh, yeah, he we'll, might he we'll, might even uh, any super fans that want to donate, he might even autograph your blow up doll. Yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> well, I, I'm playing the lottery, so uh, if I ever get. <laughs> Yeah, I was swift. The record will definitely be coming out. Right, right. Well, I can tell you as a fan, you know, a, li a lifetime fan. I, I can I can call it a lifetime at this point. It's been you know so many years since the start of all this. Um, I would I would certainly like to see something, but I also understand, you know, on the, yeah. on the other end of the scope, how that can be. Um, you know, with Blister, on the other hand, it's not going to happen because one of them is in prison. We'd have to actually do a jailbreak, and so that's a little harder to do. That might make it um, even cooler, though. Like, that <laughs> would make it cooler. I, we would probably sell the arena out, you know. But there, maybe you could do like, like a remote thing or something, <laughs> right? <laughs> or just do the what was it? Metallica played a prison show. Just do the show there. <laughs> half, half the fans might be there anyway. <laughs> After, after the people that show, I would probably say like most of the people that used to come to our shows are probably already hanging out with them. He's a rock star yeah. right there in that cell right now. Um, <laughs> he's like, that's right. I was in most, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm talking a lot of shit about a friend of mine, but I, you know, you know, um, but anyway, so there is all the questions from everybody. Um, Speaking of mics and stuff, I use the uh, 7B, actually. I, I told you I'm always partial to be sure. But Absolutely. I know a lot of singers use that in studios. Honestly, I Absolutely. tried to record some box on that. I can't get into it. I got I to gotta get a new arm, though. That thing keeps falling out. Yeah, it, but like I said, it, it, it'll work similar to basic. the... Uh, exactly. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Uh, what you'd have to do, uh, if you want the same sound that you're getting from the from the SM for the Beta 58, is you yeah. just got to cut cut the lows. That's all there is to it. It's going to sound yeah, the same. Yeah. I, I think it, the since this is already mounted, I'm just going to keep using it. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, but this is great element. for stuff like that because you get that radio voice. You know, you can be all like, and this is uh, pretty with 106.5 the end. You know what I mean? You can get all yeah. basic and shit like yeah, that. It's the proximity it. effect. And that's right. what that's designed for, you know. And certain right. people's voices are thin and they need that bass. Uh, you know, I have an SM7 in there, but oftentimes I, I still use the, the Beta 58 on people's voice, you know. And I, right, I, right. I mean, normally I start with the... the, the, the you know the Norman U87 may, mainly just because it's an expensive mic and it's all usually set works. You know, it has a high lift and a low cut already, and has the extra heat from the transformer. So you know, it's got a little more things going for, on for it. But uh, if that doesn't work for the vocalist sound, you know, the natural sound of the voice or the desired sound, then I'll go to the SM7. And sometimes if that's still not working, and I'll try to you know Beta 58, and you know. I've actually used the road a few times because it's just razor flat. That you know? baffles me, man. That just, I mean, but I'm, I might have just had a bad experience with the one I had, you know. I mean, it depends. It, Everybody's voice is different and the desired yeah. sound, you know, it just depends on what, you know, some people's, you know, voice, uh, you know, it's kind of muffled. So they need the high lift. Some people's voice is really high end and edgy and they need the softening of the, 
dynamic. So it just uh, seven B would come in. But in reality, so. all this can be done in EQ and post. I mean, that's right. you know you can you know like I said, there, there's two differences, basically, or three different microphones. Really, you got the ribbon, you got a dynamic, you got a condenser, and it's like they, they all has slightly different uh, character and different uh, transit responses and things. But other than that, it's just EQ voicing. And the Hello Kitty uh, cable soup can sound. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that's a whole thing in and of itself. That's could be the thing. coolest sound of all. It could be. You never. You know what? Now I'm tempted to try it just for a track, just to see if like an effect I, or something. The longer I do this, the crazier the, the better to me. Like I love Dude. crazy weird. Like somebody's like, "Hey, let me let me plug in this six by nine car speaker." I'm like, "Let's do it." Oh my god! I remember the car test. We went out. What was it? The oh, van. Yeah. 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 We put. Yeah. Was it a senior I, I tape still go to the truck. Percent? I always check my mixes and masters in my truck. Man, oh. y'all, we would get done with a recording, go out to his van, put that thing. It was your parents' van, too, I think, right? We, uh, we put that. Yeah, technically. Yeah. I think it, it was a CD. We, I think we were past tapes at that point. But anyway, we put that in and we would do the car test to yeah. see how it sounded in cars because that's where people would hear your stuff most of the time. They'd be yep. riding, you know. Stuff Absolutely. anyway, nostalgia. My God, we can go on for. This is officially the longest interview I've ever done. Um, <laughs> we are we are at we are at just a, about two hours right now, and it's totally fine because I've enjoyed every minute of it. Look, y'all, be on the lookout for Jamie because we are going to figure out a way to get him here, and we're going to work on these drums again. I'm going to do the drum review. We have all that to uh, look for. Thank you for everybody for sending in your questions. For everybody that sent in other questions and we didn't get to it. I'm sorry, but it's a damn good thing we didn't because we'd be here till four in the morning uh, <laughs> talking about everything. Um, but, you know, I mean, me and Jamie go way back. So, you know, we're going to be a little long winded about stuff. And, um, oh, yeah. you know, and, and I, I certainly enjoyed this. So thank you, Jamie, for doing this. I appreciate it. And uh, you know what? You all keep those swift things coming. Jamie, we got to talk to uh, Crow. Give me a swift T-shirt because I want one. I got to have one. Well, in fact, that? I'm really sad. My Jamie King T-shirt has got a wear hole. I've worn it so much. It's got a wear hole in the, in the shoulder and it really depresses the fucking shit out of me. Dude. We'll get you another one. It's whatever gotta happen. Got, <laughs> he said, whatever you need, I got you. I now he sounds that. like that, that boxing manager, the, the, the big hair. It might be um, one of those flea, flea market, like painted on types. So we'll <laughs> <laughs> God, I have totally done that for band shirts, man. Oh, I, know. I remember back in, Yeah. I've done it. I've done Ain't people no bought it. <laughs> no, I mean, this, you know, like we're a starving most, artist. We all live with our be the most valuable. Shirt. That'd be the most valuable shirt out there now. Yes, you know, the right, custom made. Right. And if, what if you had, if what if you had a metallic, a metallica one made by actually by Metallica at the flea market? I mean, that would be right. worth millions. Oh shit! Yeah, hell yeah, <laughs> hell yeah! If I would have only become Metallica, that spray yeah. painted T-shirt, all like five hundred of them that I made, be a gold mine right now. Yeah. Um, but anyways, we are going to conclude this interview. We've gone long enough, and quite frankly, I have to pee. So yeah. <laughs> we're going to close this off. <laughs> I made I'm myself laugh there. <laughs> He's going to pee with me? <laughs> no, I'm not going to. In the same boat, I say, I say that. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. Let's 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 close this before, <laughs> before I have a fucking... <laughs> I can't even catch my fucking breath, damn it. <laughs> ah, for anybody that's still watching two hours later, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jamie King. And uh, you know what? We're gonna definitely going to keep that train rolling. Y'all, I love you to death for the time you spend because that's something you can never get back. And for that, I'm very, very grateful. So as always, until next time, stay true, stay you. There we go. That's it. Awesome. All right. Appreciate it. You're a master, yeah, no. man. <laughs>